Good morning, all you cool kid talkers in the back of the room. Guess what? We're live streaming, so you have to sit down and be quiet. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah, this is um, a special show. I'm going to do a proper welcome momentarily, but y'all should know that we are live streaming. That means you're being recorded, um, and we want you to like enjoy, engage, uh, make some noise. We think that's awesome, and also just generally behave like you're on camera, because you are, because these guys are amazing. Um, they're making you look really good. Um, thanks a ton to Frostline Studios and to our tech crew. For now, I'm Marion Call. Uh, I know some of you. I don't know some of you. I'm up from Juneau, but I lived in Anchorage for 10 years. It's a ple ple pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, and I just want to start by saying that um, I had the opportunity about a month ago to represent Alaska at the National Music Policy Forum, which was really cool. We hadn't quite done that in that way before. And my favorite part of the challenge was getting up to tell people everything about Alaska music in seven minutes who had never been here. And the very first thing, the only thing I could say was, you cannot understand the music Alaskans make unless you understand that all of us are connected to the land and to the seasons in a way like nowhere else experiences, nowhere else I've ever been. Whether you've been here for a day or whether your folks have been here for 15,000 years, our connection to the land is part of what makes our music special, the music of place. Um, I want to start, of course, by acknowledging and thinking about and being grateful for the land that we're on right now, which is Denina land. Um, and we are proud and pleased to be broadcasting from here statewide. I'm so happy to be broadcasting back home to Tlingit Ani, the Akwan and Takukwan territory, also known as Juno. Um, this is an incredible place, and we are so grateful to be here. This day is going to be grounded in talking about how we make music in this place, which affects everything about how we make music, from the economics to the spiritual aspects. Um, I'd like to welcome a huge welcoming crew, and there's a reason we welcome everybody so well, and it's because this helps us know where we are and why we're here. <laughs> so, Ingle, go ahead. Yeah, grab them, grab them. We're doing very fast welcomes all at once, so. <laughs> Hello, and welcome again for <laughs> to both the people in the, yeah, there you go. Welcome to the fifth statewide Alaska Music Summit. Uh, to all of you who are here in the room and to all of you who are Zooming uh, in to see uh, us online. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to it. My name is Ingvild Vattenguttu, and I don't ask you to repeat that after me, but that is my name. I run Northern Culture Exchange and I co uh, coordinate with uh, Akimi with Marion and our team and we're just wanting to say that we're incredibly happy to see that all of you appreciate the work that's being done and I want to just thank the whole team at Akimi and NCE for all the amazing work that has been done up to this moment and beyond. Thank you. Hello everyone, it is an honor to be here uh, representing the Nave Spinard on behalf of Cook Inlet Housing Authority. My name is RJ Fontaine McKendry. I am the Nave Manager and Community Engagement Coordinator in service of the Nave Spinard. Um, we are home to a number of amazing creative artists and organizations of which Northern Culture Exchange is one of them. Uh, Ingville, Akimi, uh, Spinard Jazz Fest, uh, so many amazing musicians, all ages music co-op. These are just a few of the programs Anchorage Youth Orchestras, who have called this place home over the past year and beyond. So um, it is an honor um, and a privilege that Alaska Music Summit has chosen this space again uh, to share ideas. That is what the NAVE is about, connecting our people with ideas, uh, whether that be in the nonprofit sector, whether you are in healthcare, whether you are in the arts. We need everyone in order to raise our community up and to celebrate all the talent that is here. So thank you, each and every one of you, for being here today, sharing your talent. Uh, your expertise and your desire to invest in our community. Uh, and thank you to Marion and Engvall for putting this on. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. On behalf of the municipality of Anchorage, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to Anchorage. Uh, my name is Assemblymember George Martinez. I represent District 5, which is east side. Holla. Um, 
It's good to be with you all today. Uh, I, I believe in the creative economies. I believe in building the music ecosystem. And as a traveling artist and a touring artist in my past life, uh, I believe in the, the connection between our region. And I had the chance to travel to Boise uh, with Marion uh, to the Music Policy Forum with the chair of the assembly as well. So we're bringing those connections back. And I look forward to doing that work. But I just wanted to leave it on this note as well. This this is the MLK weekend, and our community has a bridge builder history. And for those who don't know, we have an organization of the bridge builders, but it's in the spirit of building the beloved community. And there was a vision that Anchorage could be the first community without prejudice. And I just want you to just make the connection between music, the soulfulness of, of the ecosystem that we have to build, and the opportunity for justice and advancing real positive change in our community. And it all starts, for me, with a beat. Thank you all. Good morning, my name is Laura Forbes. I'm the Arts Education Program Director at the Alaska State Council on the Arts, and I'm so grateful to be here with you today. I want to acknowledge that some of you may be um, uh, already in conversation or relationship with my colleagues at the Alaska State Council on the Arts, Charlie Sears, Patty Lilly, Andrea Noble, and our 11 um, council trustees. Um, we are all grateful to you for I am grateful to be invited. I am grateful to all of you for accepting the invitation to come and join this conversation today and the ongoing conversations year over year. Inside my brain, when I get to attend these things, there are these like visual threads of light and color and joy and relationship and connection and repair and building that I sometimes think I can actually physically see in the room. I know sometimes it feels like in the chaos and transition and cycles that move too slow or too fast as we were talking about before, those threads that you build over these couple of days help us move forward together in a way that makes a lot of sense. And I wanna say how grateful I am to the organizers of this event and everybody supporting it being able to happen statewide because it is no small feat to make space and hold space for us to be able to stop and do this. So thank you so much and I'm so grateful to be here. Um, okay, those are tough acts to follow, but... <laughs> My name is Timmy Dolan. Um, I am the um, project manager from the Pacific Northwest chapter of the Recording Academy. So our chapter covers Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, Hawaii, and Western Canada. So as you can hear, we are one of the most geographically and musically and people diverse of chapters, I believe, within the Academy. Now, the Academy, I think most people are familiar with um, them for putting on the Grammy Awards, but we are actually an organization who works um, year round in support of musicians and creators. And so I'm based in Seattle. I represent the members that make up um, the professionals, the creators, the students who are part of the member body across all of those states. Um, our organization also works to advocate for legislation that supports creators and musicians. And we have um, a nonprofit arm that is there to support music creators called Music Cares. And that's something that's available to all. You know, <laughs> that's something that's available to all. We um, Music Cares is something that can offer um, financial support, medical support, addiction recovery support. And um, it's something that's accessible to you as a music creator in this room. So I'm so honored to be here. Um, thank you so much to Marion and everyone in this organization. Thank you to the Alaska music community for being so welcoming. I'm here to listen and learn. And um, please come up and introduce yourself. And I look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. Yeah, just put it right there. 
I also want to mention this is Timmy's first time in Alaska, so everyone make her feel super welcome. Warm words of welcome. A special thank you to the guests who have traveled from the lower 48 to be here. We are so grateful and excited to hear your presentations. And on behalf of Akimi, thank you all for being here, those of you in the room, as well as those of you in the Zoom room. I'm looking at one of these cameras. Um, I'm here to introduce the th this year's, the theme of this year's music summit, which is From Obstacles to Opportunity. So, hello, I am Lisa Hawkins. I work for Akimi slash Music Alaska slash Northern Culture Exchange, the whole family of organizations, um, doing social media and marketing and web design and administrative work and stuff. So, uh, I am also an artist. Um, I am a full-time manager and performer in Pipeline Vocal Project, which is an... Oh, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Some of you have heard of us. Yay. Um, we are an acapella group based in Anchorage, Alaska, and um, we have been very blessed post-COVID to be busy doing international music ambassadorship and touring. Uh, we were most recently in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Jordan and Hong Kong to name a few and uh, I've been learning a lot about uh, different music industries music communities and how they function within their own structures so as I introduce the theme I wanted to give you some context because it does involve a little bit of uh, my own story so in the early days of establishing Pipeline Vocal Project, I found myself feeling extremely overwhelmed by what I felt were the obstacles that were in my way to quote unquote make it um, being from Alaska, being so far away, being a woman in the contemporary a cappella industry, they just felt very overwhelming to me. Um, I, I'm sure many of you in this room can understand the hurdles that come with the geographical location of Alaska, being so isolated from everything else. And as far as context for being a woman in contemporary a cappella, there are no all-female groups full-time doing it out there until now. And thank you. <laughs> um, just to give you some perspective, women weren't even allowed to be members of the Barbershop Harmony Society until 2018. That was, <laughs> yes, that was six years ago. So in 2018 and 2019, as I was conceptualizing this idea of Pipeline Vocal Project, I didn't even have the name yet. Um, after I processed the overwhelm and started to get ready for action, I started to change my mindset. So instead of, we're from Alaska, we could never make a living doing this, too. We're from Alaska. That makes us rare, interesting, marketable, desirable. Going from, there are no women in contemporary acapella, there are no groups to even audition for, to, there are no women in acapella. That makes us rare, interesting, marketable, desirable. So these two factors that I thought were big obstacles actually became a huge part of our brand. And uh, frankly, it's these two traits that have really gotten us into a lot of doors, have started a lot of conversation because people are intrigued. And uh, that mindset of turning obstacles into opportunities, into strengths, um, has really helped me in my career. So now I, I teach some classes at different acapella festivals and conferences, and one of the classes I teach is, is from obstacles to opportunities. So when the theme, the, the, the prompt of the theme came up this year, um, I have been working under Akimi and NCE slash Music Alaska uh, for about two years now, understanding its goals, better understanding our music ecosystem, and what we as an organization want to provide for the community. This theme, this phrase just kept popping into my mind, um, and it just felt like the perfect fit. Because I think the Alaska music community has so much to offer, has so much that is rare interesting, marketable, and desirable. We just have to frame it that way. And there are so many ways to overcome those obstacles, whether that be turning them into strengths, or maybe it's just literally making them smaller by collaborating with the people in this room, the amazing talent, the brains, brain power in this room. Maybe it's cross-pollinating between within our community to elevate each other up, to amplify our voices. So 
I hope that as we get inspired by the many presentations that we will hear today, and we will hear from some brilliant minds, that you absorb the information with this theme in mind, from obstacles to opportunities. So, but I've talked long enough. Um, I would like to welcome, and before we kick off the presentations, Ingvil back onto the stage to talk to you about the family of organizations that I listed that are many. <laughs> and she's going to, you're going to come up this way? Okay, please welcome Ingvil van Guthu. Thank Thanks again. And you could say that, um, I'm just going to see if I can move this forward here. Oh, maybe this is the DIY. It's a different presentation. No, am I doing the wrong way? Well, I'm really technically um, on top of this. This is part of the thing. Yeah, okay, I see what's going on. You could say that um, a culture or a community is defined by how it has turned obstacles into opportunity. All over the circumpolar north, all living things in this place is actually a proof that in order to survive and thrive, you have to adapt and work constructively with a set of conditions that's given. And don't forget that part of thriving is actually enjoying what you're doing. My ongoing learning experience is actually that, because I get a little um, over-attached to the result, and I'm learning to enjoy what I'm doing all the time and allowing things to take the time that they have to take. That makes it a lot more enjoyable. So, is it a hurdle or is it something fun to jump over? <laughs> I hope that we keep learning from this place and from each other, uh, how to build and shape culture and community with an outlook of joy and opportunity. So Alaskans today are lucky. Have you thought about that? We're actually really lucky right now in that we have a lot of opportunity to shape our future. And the future that we are going to concern ourselves with today and tomorrow is, of course, the future of our music community. And um, the way I would like for people to think about this is that if something is missing, in our community, then we have the opportunity to create it and shape it from scratch. And if something isn't working, we can actually fix it. And it can be a good idea, I think, in both those cases, both creating and fixing, to look around and see what others have done and learn what works. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today and tomorrow, learning from a lot of people who have tried things and see what can work for us. Not quite sure, but I think I'd have an obstacle, but I also have an opportunity to learn it. There you go. <clears throat> in the two decades that I have lived in Alaska, I have had the opportunity to dream up and build a lot of different things from scratch. And in the past few years, much of the attention that I have had to give has been on the founding and developing and building Akimi. In the beginning, I remember we used to say to each other, we don't know what we don't know. And that was both sometimes in frustration, and sometimes it was sort of like a way to get out of it. The fact that we, we're ignorant, right? We're remote, we're underserved. And um, then, since then, we've had, since the first summit, we've had a chance to learn so much. And um, this immense amount of learning, I would say, and building, uh, we're going to hear more about from our master builder, Marion Cole, who uh, is, has been doing a lot of work, in particular this last year, and she's going to tell us of one of her most recent learning experiences, which is the Alaska Music Census. But before that, allow me to plug one other opportunity that Akimi has created for you, for us, in the past year, and that's open for everyone to take part in. 
That's the Alaska Playlist Project. Have you all seen this? Have, are you all on there? Yes? Absolutely. Alaska Playlist Project was properly launched in November, but I think it's been launched for a long time in 2023. Marion, Emily Anderson, and Ed Schoenfeld, thank you so much for all the amazing work that you did putting that together. Um, <clears throat> music Alaska Spotify playlist has over 20 hours of Alaskan music. Cause Spotify bought to recognize that there's a category called Alaskan music, and now Alaskan uh, music has several playlists, many playlists. I think uh, maybe I have. Yeah, oh, I had some of those there. And um, the Alaskan Indie is now a, a category that has been recognized worldwide. Um, we should also mention that including the first playlist that we have by a guest DJ, Katie B, and then we're hoping to do more with other beloved local DJs in future. So those of you in the room and on Zoom, we're going to come for you and get your playlists. But now to talk about what we have learned in the Alaska Music Census and maybe some other things, here is Marion Call. Thank you. Yes, I know, I, I stole it already. There you go. Um, in, uh, none of you are uh, over-planning producers, uh, organizing incredibly complex events, are you? Um, because I have been um, working with an incredible team on this for several weeks, and of course the one thing I didn't finish was my own presentation. Um, so, we're going to be speaking from the heart, but I think that's okay because I have been kept awake at night, every night for the past several weeks thinking about what I'm going to say. So, I'm, I'm going to, all right, we're just going to, going to go with it, going to trust the performance instincts. Um, and I also do have a few images that um, my part of my team, Lauren, uh, pulled together for me because the most important thing I want to express here is honestly a little bit of the kind of spiritual stuff to start with, right? It's... Um, I'm glad you mentioned the future and like opportunities in the future because uh, I've had a few years of futurelessness, I'd say, since over the past few years, it has been increasingly hard um, for those of us who are sensitive to the world, for those of us who are sensitive to our ecology, to our community, to injustice, to uh, politics, you know, it has been very, very hard to look forward. Um, if you have been having that feeling, I have been having that feeling too. Um, it is very hard to imagine that life in 10 years looks anything like this life. Um, and I've been trying to figure out how to navigate that. It could look nothing like this life because a lot of the creature comforts and structures that a lot of people I care about have spent generations building are you know, swept away or made irrelevant. It could be that technology and comfort advances to the rate where we don't recognize what's happening. Now, it is very hard to tell <laughs> which of those is going to be or what's going to happen. We do know Alaska is going to be a point of radical change as the poles melt. We know that. We don't know what that looks like. Um, I still have old timers in my community worried about population loss. I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know that that's the thing you need to worry about, friend. Um, I'm worried about some Elon Musk coming and setting up in town. and. Uh, you know, but trying to buy out the local government. I want to future proof us against that. You be quiet, phone. Um, <laughs> um, in these years of not being able to see forward, which I think is part of an artist's craft, is looking ahead. Um, honestly, the feeling of just blankness of maybe, are we going to fall off a cliff? Is there an end there? Like what, what, because I couldn't see past it, it felt like there's just a curtain drop, just nothing. And that ground me to a halt for a couple of years. I don't, I would be embarrassed to say that, except I know I'm not alone. And I know there are some people in our audience in online and here and who will watch this later who are going through capital D difficulties right now um, and who have gone. And I, I kind of don't like conferences that don't stop and just like say that. We're artists, we can talk about this, right? We don't have to pretend like that's not something that is happening to us and people we love. Um, and I have so much love for the folks in my community experiencing this. And I just wanna share that the thing 
that helped me move from a total stop, I would say, in 2019, before, before pandemic, 2019, 2020, being able to move forward from just a total stop of I can't see what comes next, I don't know what's next in my career, no more albums, touring, the money doesn't work out anymore, streaming is, you know, eating my lunch and, and, and I'm, my lower back's getting older and oh my God, oh my God. Um, into that futurelessness, I realized something and that is that there is no human future of any kind under any circumstances without music. There is no human future without arts. As long as there are humans in Alaska, as long as there are Alaskans, there will be Alaskan music. And as long as there have been Alaskans for 10, 15,000 years, there has been Alaskan music, right? This is, this is something, the whole world can change around us. The computers can make all the music they want. Have fun, guys. It won't stop us, because we can't stop. Music is not a thing we do to make money. It's not a thing we do because it's fun. It's not a thing we do because it's frivolous. It's a thing we do because it is a fundamental trait of our species. And I will say this all the time. It's like birds do their little songs. It's like bees do their little dances. Like, that's a thing we do. And we will not stop. Have fun, computers, whatever. We're not going to stop. And that understanding has made it possible for me to start moving forward again, because I realized that if there is a future in human music, no matter what else happens, then time spent building that future and building a community that is robust in that future and that takes care of each other in that future is time well spent, right? Like making that art is a thing I do because I'm a human and making it possible for other people to make more art sustainably here where I live is work that, I mean, I don't know, some things are gonna work, some things aren't. Some of our little initiatives are gonna work, some aren't, but that work is worth doing, right? Um, and I know a lot of y'all are on this boat with me. So, um, anyway, light subject to start, but also like, I just, I don't know, I, 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 I'm a lyricist, I write real things. I'm really not interested in pretending. I'm interested in telling the truth here because a lot of you guys, and your music has told the truth to me. Um, part of working on our playlist project, our little Spotify games that we've been playing, right? It's, it's ramshackle, it's piecemeal, right? Like it'll take several weeks for us to get back to people or whatever, but we've processed thousands of songs by Alaskan artists at this point. Sometimes people send us three whole albums and like, we're like, well, we can only put three songs you know, on here, but we, okay, here we go. And the thing is my ears have been full of your music all year. And so of the folks who've worked on this, it's a really fun project. It really wakes you up, man. My Spotify wrapped was 100% Alaska Indie, which is a category. I think Spotify invented because of that account, just like <laughs> trying to find every Alaskan band. Because you can't sort bands by geography. We had to do that work. We had to tell the algorithm what was what. I don't like Spotify. I don't support them. But if they're going to use us, we're going to use them right back, right? All right, there's a lot of people trying to use musicians. There's always been a lot of people trying to use musicians. I don't think there was a golden age. They were, I don't think there was a golden age when we were all perfectly paid and compensated and comfortable. I just don't think that existed. It has always been a hustle, um, and it has always been a little bit tough. But the, the elements that make it work and that make it worthwhile are when you have a community to get, when you have a community to catch you when you have other people looking out for you, when you have community built structures that you can rely on, right? Um, and I've spent the last couple of years essentially immersed through this work with Akimi and hey, what did people do that made it better where they live, you know? If touring's getting harder, if streaming's eating our lunch, I really feel like the future of music is local. The future of music is us believing in and fostering the music we're making and expanding that definition of music to include all the people that we usually forget, right? Um, which brings me to the more talky part of my talk. Um, <laughs> um, uh, people are always surprised when they come to this conference um, and or they come to any Akimi event and they, I think we unintentionally bring our biases into the room as far as imagining everyone's here for what we're here for, right? I'm a female indie singer-songwriter who toured and slept on couches, right? I accidentally put that out into the world. Oh yeah, other, other traveling musician wandering troubadour types, right? Um, who like to play sh shows at comic conventions. I don't know why, but, um, but 
we have people represented here from the whole of music, right? There are a lot of jobs in music, despite what parents tell the kids these days. There's a lot of jobs. There are folks here who are educators and who are at their absolute pinnacle of understanding music pedagogy, right? There are folks here who are instrumentalists and vocalists and composers, yes, but there are also luthiers, there are also instrument creators, there are also music therapists, there are also bookers and presenters, there are promoters, there are venues, there are festival organizers, um, and there are even more niche, 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 niche things that we've started learning about. So I think that the challenge um, that I would invite all of you to, that has been my year essentially, is when I think of musician, to start really blowing up that image of what is a musician. And uh, not just think of me and other people like me, not just think of other indie bands putting songs on Spotify, but to think of our elderly Athabascan fiddler neighbor, right? To think of the community dance hall, to think of people playing in worship services, to think of the local cantor at the synagogue, right? To think of people getting together and jamming in the backyard, and to think of people going Christmas caroling and annoying their neighbors, right? All of this, all of this is music. Our community theater, the musicals, the pit orchestra, right? The folks working with the dance groups, the wedding DJs, the people playing in clubs late at night, even I have no idea who wrote the Twin Dragon Mongolian barbecue jingle. <laughs> but if that is not an enduring piece of Alaskan culture, <laughs> that kind of commercial music, that is work in our sector. That is part of our circle, right? So um, this summer we undertook the Alaska Music Census, which is very hard to explain to people. <laughs> And I got very tired of doing it, but a lot of y'all took it, and thank you. Oh my God, thank you. We had a tremendous response rate to the Alaska Music Census, and I bet it was a weird thing to see, right? I bet it was weird. We did all the talking we could. We talked our heads off, me and the music ambassadors that I worked with. I should have had a list up here, but some of them are Kat Moore, Carrie Pavish, Anderson, Zach Pease, Lisa Denny, Lisa Puanani Mohala Ikalani Denny, um, and uh, oh, Emily Anderson, um, and more. And if I'm forgetting someone, I'm so sorry. I did not sleep very much. Um, all of these working musicians went out and got their friends and neighbors to take a stupid survey. But that is miraculous. It really is. Because when we have data, we can start putting ourselves on the map. We can start saying, here's who's out here. Here's how much they're earning. Here's how much we're contributing to the local economy, um, which is something that certain people are interested in. I'm half interested in that. Like, I'm half interested in the opportunity in our economy. I'm also half interested in some of the other questions we got to ask, because we did the survey ourselves. We did it with a lot of support. We did a lot of support from ICER, Portland Music. Um, but we took the survey ourselves, which means we own the data. And some of the questions we asked were, how many hours are you putting into your music? Because to me, that's a more important measure of the cultural relevance. And it also allows us to do the nice little mathematical trick of, okay, how many hours per week did you play music? How much did you earn? How much is that really per hour? Like something that I think people who pay for gigs don't always appreciate. Um, so I uh, was going to have a lot of really nice slides for you um, about that. I have a couple, um, but not all the fancy numbers. We will, however, be sharing all of the fancy numbers in your email wrap up that comes right after this. Um, I have a few, I do, a few things I do want to say. One is that all the surveys, most of the surveys that we looked at early on as models asked us to essentially divvy up um, both our Alaska music sector and the roles in that sector, right? Like how many venues of this kind, how many of that kind, how many businesses of this kind, how many businesses of that kind, um, how many people are educators, how many people are artists, how many people are doing another music job, presenters, bookers, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, how much activity is in which part of the state. Um, that's fine. Um, and that, that kind of comports with, I'm a big science nerd, I really, uh, it's embarrassing, but like, that comports with the understanding I was taught of the natural world, that things divide into categories, and then you measure the category and you see how much is each one. Um, but the fact is, both in the scientific world 
and in the world around me as I start to question some of the values I was handed down, values like hierarchy, values like false binaries, um, I start to realize that things aren't quite that simple. Um, things don't divvy up that way. And when I actually look at the world around me, when I look at you guys, and as I comb through the data on all the people that we surveyed, like what we see is actually this. Right? We see, can I go backwards? There we go. Yeah, there's a good old tumbleweed, right? We see many, many points of connection at every turn. We see evolving and changing nodes. We see little key points that can, you know, then move and, and establish a new identity, try a new thing, pull back, do whatever, right? People playing many roles, businesses playing many roles. It's Alaska, we're all Swiss Army knives, right? That's one of our greatest strengths. That's one of our greatest assets. Um, this is more, when, when I actually look at nature and try and cut it up into little pieces like that, it doesn't work for me. And this is why I'm really happy that the language in our, in our field has started to talk about music as an ecosystem more than an economy. That makes a lot more sense. It just makes a lot more sense. When you look at us, when you think of Alaska music statewide, and you think of the little players and the big players, and the movement and the growth and the change, that to me is an ecosystem. That makes a lot more sense. Some of it happens for free, some of it happens for pay, and it takes on its own unique shape, which Lauren thankfully found this very cool. Picture. I, want, I want this chair. Um, <laughs> um, the reason that that's important to understand is that um, the data we got told us some really cool things about the people we surveyed, but some of the most important things to me, um, we got money data, that's cool. It told us things that would take, we should do an hour on that instead of a few minutes. Um, but it also told us that the average number of roles a person plays. We asked how many roles do you play? Take all that apply. Not just which one are you, are you an artist, are you a presenter, are you a whatever. It was which all things do you do, right? And the average number was in the neighborhood of three or four, right? The, our, our, our average and median were very high for that. We asked people not just, are you in a band? We asked how many bands are you in, in an average year? And guess what? Y'all are in a lot of bands. Um, <laughs> the majority of people were in two or more ensembles. Like, if you were in an ensemble, if you said, yes, I am in some kind of ensemble, um, the median number that you were in is 2.48. I don't know who the 0.48 is, but I've been in bands like that, so. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one of my other favorite things was that we asked not only where are you based right now, like where are you based for the money purposes of this survey. Uh, oh, this is not, I'm not, that's not my passcode. This is the passcode of someone else that I need to use. Um, not only where are you based right now, but which other multiple Alaskan communities are you connected to? And 30% said, I'm connected to more than one Alaska community. Like, yes, I live in Anchorage, but I have a really strong connection to Naknek. Yes, I live in Homer, but I identify as being from Nanilchik, right? Like, these are important to me. These are very important. And even when it came to primary community, and I'm gonna have to scroll a little bit, pardon me here, to get to it, um, our primary communities, list was incredibly impressive to me. I mean, we heard from Delta Junction, we heard from Heidelberg, we heard from Cake, we heard from Port Lyons and Soldovia and St. Mary's. We heard from Unalakleet, we heard from Willow, we heard from Healy, we heard from Hope. And to me, that is gorgeous. That is absolutely gorgeous. And those were primary communities, not secondary. Um, but at least 30% of people said that they were from multiple communities. I'm sorry, 20% of people said that they have a connection to more than two communities besides their primary. Um, and that's why, that, that's only the beginning of the reason why this ecosystem concept is important to me. Um, and I am looking at my time here. And it's time for me to wrap it up. So. <laughs> I care about this a lot. Um, I care about you a lot. More important than giving you a specific number, which I can do better in the wrap up anyway, um, <laughs> which is coming sometime next week after we've all slept a little. Um, more important than that is to make sure that you understand that whatever your role is in this ecosystem, it is crucial. If you are the leaf litter and the compost, if you are the deep old roots, if you are the teeny baby branches, just doing one leaf at a time, or if you're a big strong branch supporting a lot of other people, like none of that is irrelevant. None of that is superfluous. And just like any other ecosystem, you can put things into it, you can do things to it that make it unhealthy. 
and you can do things to it that make it healthy, right? So this is our opportunity to think about it like that and think, okay, what can we do with this kind of beautiful little, little natural wonder that we have here? What makes it healthy? What's the fertilizer? What's the water? What's the clean air that we inject into this to give it durability through whatever changes are ahead and to support more people making music in the way that they want to make music in their community? Big community, small community, part-time, full-time, making money, never making money, and impractical or practical, whatever it is. Um, how do we enrich this and see all of ourselves as a piece of it just as much as the musician doing the absolute opposite thing. Whatever the, the, the thing that is the most different from what we are doing in this music ecosystem, we are a part of it, we are connected to them, and our fate is tied to theirs. And that's why I'm very excited about pursuing solutions that are good for us individually, but starting to think of this as solutions that are good for all of us. Um, I'm gonna conclude, and we're gonna move into the next portion of our day with some of our spotlight videos, which we solicit from artists statewide. If you wanna do this sometime in the next year or so, just get in touch. Welcome from the Anchorage Folk Festival. I'm Mary Ann, past president with... John Osman, current board president. Anchorage Folk Festival is a community-based, member-driven, volunteer-run, non-profit based in Anchorage, Alaska. Our purpose is to perpetuate an annual folk arts festival with live performances and the broadest representation of the performers in our community. And we've done this for 35 years, and it's all free. It's an annual festival, the last two weekends of January, mostly at the University of Alaska Anchorage with performances in the Wendy Williamson Auditorium. We feature main stage acts, professional guest artists, workshops, dances, a raffle, and all the details for the festival can be found at anchoragefolkfestival.org. We'll see you at the see Wendy. See you there. Hi, I'm Harmony. And I'm J-Bo. And we make instrumentals. I like playing guitar, piano, violin, and I like singing too. And I like playing piano and recording artists when they come into the studio. The reason why I like making instrumentals is because I get to use different instruments and I get to make a beat. And then I get to put it on my YouTube channel and give it away for free. That way other artists can use it. So one change that we want to do this year is to actually open up the studio a little bit more for artists to actually do more of a in-studio performance. Now, we're not actually gonna be recording in different takes to make a record, but for you to come in and to actually perform one or two of your tracks. How much does it cost? Nothing. What is the age requirement? None. If you're ready to perform at any age from five to 55, well then come in. Hit us up on our Facebook page, Harmony and J-Bo Audio, if you ever wanted to come through and perform one or two of your tracks. Or hit me up on my Facebook page, J-Bo Audio. All right, that was it for today. Bye, see ya. One. Hello Alaska Music Summit, my name is Sarah Felder. I'm a percussionist from Fort Worth, Texas, currently residing in Anchorage, Alaska. The year 2023 was a year of a lot of new opportunities, collaborations, and growth for me. From playing with the Anchorage Cabaret Band, to the Spinard Jazz Fest, even the Monday Night Jazz Sessions, at the Fire Island Bakery. I also launched Divine Music Studio where I was able to bring a lot of different musicians together for further collaborations. And I began giving private drum lessons as an instructor. Lastly, at the end of 2022, I launched a band called Wasabi Black. And in 2023, we traveled the state of Alaska playing on stages anywhere from Seward to Girdwood to Fairbanks, even the Alaska Airline Center. Moving into 2024, you could catch me almost every Sunday at New Season Church. February the 2nd, you could catch Wasabi Black back at Humpy's. And February 23rd, you can catch me at Little Babes playing with Caitlin. Stay tuned for more dates and collaborations to come. Hi, Kimi. My name's Mike Moss. I'm from Juno. I'm a music teacher and artist. My music studio is called Nagoonberry's Music, and I teach piano, guitar, and music production, songwriting theory type lessons. Uh, but my specialty lately has been rock band. Students come and choose a rock band instrument. I teach them the basics. I put them together in groups based on age level and ability, and off we go. It's super fun. Uh, right now, I have bands made up of fourth and fifth graders all the way up to an adult band. I'm also a songwriter and producer, and I put out music under the artist name Blue Nagoon, short for Nagoonberries, and I 
primarily make vocal pop music these days in various genres, and I like to work with local singers to sing the songs. Last year I put out two albums. The first was called Crestfallen, a chill pop, jazz, lo-fi type album with Alyssa Fisher on vocals. And the second was a synth pop and 80s rock magnum opus called Here Be Dragons, and that features nine different lead singers, six of which were from Juno. Lately, I've started producing other people's music, which has been a blast. Uh, and it's always great to meet and work with new people. So if any of this stuff sounds interesting to you, please feel free to drop me a line. Uh, yeah, that's me, Mike Moss, Blue Nagoon, signing out. Hi, Alaska Music Summit. Casey Smith Project here from the Golden Heart City of Fairbanks, Alaska. It's been a busy 2023. We had uh, our new album come out, Red Lights and Whiskey, last February. In April, we got to go to Juneau for the Folk Festival. And over the summer, we made our way to Girdwood for the Forest Fair, to Denali, McCarthy, Palmer, to name a few. 2024 shaping up nice too. We're gonna go to Hawaii for our first out-of-state tour this February. And then in March, first and second, we'll be in Girdwood at the Sitzmark with Sundog. Those dates and all of our new music can be found on our website at caseysmithproject.com. This is a function of wishing we could get everyone in the room at the same time, but I'm so happy that we can broadcast this statewide right now. We have a lot of people watching on Zoom right now, and we'll have a lot of people see it in the future. Um, I would like to welcome um, one of our keynote speakers for this year, um, Reed Wick. Uh, part of the reason is because we got connected through the Recording Academy, but then I think we started talking a lot more about how solutions from outside Alaskans need to be paying attention to. We often either get grabby hands and kind of grab a thing and are like, why won't it fit here? You know, try to do the exact same thing here. Or else we get a little bit proud and like, we don't need to know what you think, right? Um, I'm really interested in finding out what other folks are doing. So the next few segments, the next few speakers are for looking at cool stuff that is happening in other places. To kick us off, Reed Wick. I guess it's the big button. The big button. I'm going to set my timer because I know I can ran, ramble on, like Led Zeppelin would say. So uh, thank you for having me. It's my first time in Alaska, too. This is an amazing place. So I got here on Tuesday and took in Girdwood, and I'm here for the weekend and then heading with Marion and a few other folks down to Juneau on Monday. So I'm getting uh, not the whole tour, but a good tour. Um, but... As was mentioned, um, I'm with the Recording Academy. I'm one of Timmy's uh, colleagues. I am based in New Orleans. Um, I'm part of a chapter that's based in Memphis that covers from St. Louis down to, New down to New Orleans, up and down the Mississippi River. And you may ask yourself, why would somebody from New Orleans uh, want to come up here and talk? Um, but, you know, thinking about your theme, uh, obstacles to opportunities, that is exactly what we deal with every day. I mean, we, in New Orleans, for those of us who are old enough, because some aren't, um, we have a pre-Katrina life and a post-Katrina life. Life is totally different after Katrina. So is our music community. And we've had a lot of obstacles, obstacles to overcome. Similarly, we all felt the, the COVID downfall. And in a city where tourism is our biggest industry and music is a big part of that, we actually were put out of work for a long time as well. I'm a full-time musician as well as a full-time uh, working, sorry, working for the Recording Academy. And one of my areas of, uh, I guess, expertise, I hate saying that because I'm not an expert in anything, but is working in the public policy and economic development space. It's something that I've been very passionate about. And it really comes from many years of watching my elders across New Orleans with commissions and task force and everything else bitch and complain, talk about all these things that need to be fixed, but no one lifted a finger to actually do it, right? And I'm like, as I got older, and especially after Katrina, it made me realize, okay, now I'm one of those somewhat elders, and it's my turn. And really what I felt like um, is that we had to change the whole way we approach thing. Approach things, I should say. So uh, let me get my thing going here. Oh, I passed it up. So these are the the areas that I really felt like we needed to change our attitude as a music community. 
Oh, it didn't change. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Sorry. There you go. Uh, we, we needed to decide to act and lead. So that kind of fell on me and some of my colleagues. Luckily, my, my bosses at the Recording Academy gave me the freedom to be able to, to take on some of this work. Um, one of the biggest things that I realized is that we needed to change the conversation, meaning that um, primarily for our purposes, we needed to change the conversation away from art and culture as much. And I know you're going to start throwing tomatoes at me for this, but, but essentially when you're talking with business leaders, um, elected leaders, what they understand is they understand jobs, they understand economic impact, they understand those kind of things, especially when I always felt like music was being wagged by the dog of tourism. And I've tried to flip that conversation around because we wouldn't have the tourism if we didn't have the music that comes from New Orleans, right? And people throw in food and architecture, those things too, but really music is what makes us special. Uh, this is going back to advocacy. Advocacy to me is a, a big area of uh, where we launched this whole initiative. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. And then rallying the troops. In this case, it's calling all my friends, getting my Recording Academy members, getting the local business communities together so that we can go to Baton Rouge, our state capital, we can go to City Hall, and we can talk and make our voice heard. And to me, that's the most important thing. I'm just going to buzz through these really quickly. But advocacy really is, uh, is making yourself aware of what needs to be changed and then being that conduit to actually uh, arm yourself with that knowledge and be able to talk to your business leaders, your legislators, whatever that might be, so that they have a, a really good understanding of it as well. Um, and this is one of the things I like to tell my fellow musicians, is that your voice is more powerful than the average citizen. For one, we have an audience, right? When we go play gigs, we actually can affect, through our music, through our, what we say on stage, we actually can affect change a lot more than the average citizen. So why don't we harness that power and actually put it to use? Um, and then the other thing that I would always hear from folks when I try to rally the troops is like, well, I don't know any of these politicians. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I'm like, they're just people. And actually, one of the things I've learned the most is that they are bombarded with so many issues that if you don't make your voice heard, you just don't exist. In their minds, you just don't exist. And that's just the fact of them being bombarded by so many issues. And so my goal has been, is I've actually become friends with a lot of these politicians. They're just people. In fact, they love music. Republican, Democrat, Independent, they all love music. And the other secret thing is, we bring the cool factor to them. They want to rub elbows with us, right? They want to be in a picture with us. When we do our annual advocacy day, the senators all come running because they want to get in the photo with the musicians. Why don't we harness that to our advantage, right? That's the thing I, I like to pr um, present. Go, oh, all right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you've heard the phrase, it's all about the economy, right? We've heard that so many times. That's what the politicians understand. In Louisiana, and, and I'm going to go through this here in a second, but uh, they understand jobs. And if you play gigs, whether it's full-time, part-time, if you're earning some money from it, it's a job. If you're the front of house guy or girl at a show, if you're running the video, if you're managing the band, if you're whatever, the ecosystem that Marion referred to, every single one of those is a job. And if you're earning money at it, it's economic impact. How do you judge that? How do you, how do you bring that together as information that you can then tell your politicians or business leaders or, or a banker or whoever it is, right? And that's what I've, I'm so pleased that y'all did this summit. I mean, the... Um, the survey, because we don't have one in New Orleans yet. In fact, we're just now um, starting to embark on one that really looks more at the individual musicians and who does what. So this is based on Louisiana, obviously, but when I can show this kind of information to my politician friends, their minds are blown. They have no idea that music is worth $1.2 billion to the economy of Louisiana. This is, this, this is 2022 data. Um, the Economist collects this every year. In fact, the same year, I pulled up Alaska. Come on. This year, in 2022, Alaska's GDP was impacted by $222 million 
over 5,500 plus jobs, 534 music establishments, 161 people getting royalties that they can track, and 1,300 songwriters that they've been able to track. And this is The Economist, this is, um, uh, what do you call it, the PROs, this is um, all the different organizations that collect that kind of data and then collect it with, work with The Economist to pull this data together. So in Louisiana, I'm able to point out, you know, last year we had 31 Grammy nominations from the region. Uh, we literally have, we are the festival capital of the world. I mean, we have festivals for everything. Shrimp, petroleum, you know, uh, that's one festival. Uh, we probably have 20 crawfish festivals. We probably have 50 seafood festivals. I play them all. And you know what? I'm making money. I'm taking their money. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we're missing. There's a lot of opportunity that we have uh, that we haven't taken advantage of, and we're starting to. Uh, I also like to point out that our industry is poised for growth. Uh, luckily, we have organizations like Goldman Sachs who actually track the industry as a whole. And while we think that you know Spotify has killed our industry and all those things, and I'm not a big fan of Spotify, actually the Recording Academy had to drink, bring me in kicking and screaming to actually get a Spotify account. But now I use it to my advantage. I actually find some really amazing music. And now that I saw that Alaska thing, I'm going to start listening to more of your music because I can find it easy. Um, but these numbers are impressive. Um, and I'll share this deck with everybody. I'll give it to Marion to make sure. So I don't want to spend the time going through those numbers because there's other things I'd like to cover. Um, change. All right. I think I skipped the slide. No, no, no. Um, so what are the problems that we were trying to fix in New Orleans? These are the major ones. Reverse the cash outflow earned by our artists. And I'll have a slide to demonstrate that. Reverse the brain drain of our students who graduate from these music industry programs. I come from higher ed. I helped start the music industry program at, Louis, at Loyola University in New Orleans back in the 90s. And these kids graduate and they want to work in the music industry. They've been trained to be managers and lawyers and booking agents and, and artists. And they've always traditionally had to leave New Orleans to go get a job. Um, so we want to be able to find a way to create jobs to empower our local ecosystem and keep those kids in New Orleans and, uh, and find ways to have our artists make more money from the music that they create. Come on, go. Come on. All right. Uh, so this was just one band. I used this slide uh, back in 2017. It's still the best slide. Uh, that explains it, but I used it for the band The Revivalists, who came out of New Orleans, and at the time, they had just had their first number one hit. They were now going on the road, making an average of 25 grand a night. Now they're up to 100 grand a night. But when you look at all, all the different services that The Revivalists need to be a professional band touring are all outside of New Orleans. So all the money that's earned by these different, whether it's production people, publishing people, booking agents, you know, management, record labels, all of that leaves our economy. So how do we reverse that? How do we bring that cash flow back to our economy? And as you'll learn, I mean, I, I know I didn't get to see the numbers either, but just from talking to Marion, it sounds like y'all have lots of these pieces of this ecosystem already here, right? So being able to quantify that and be able to use that to your advantage to grow, to get people to really want to pay attention more, to, to want to participate more, I think those are all positive things. Maybe I'm pointing the wrong direction. Okay. So this basically just kind of is a bullet point list of the opportunities that we have for Louisiana. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But essentially, we have a lot of the pieces of that puzzle that are in place, and it's time for us to bring them together. So in doing this work, what it led to was the creation in 2017 of the New Orleans Music Economy Initiative. So um, we passed some legislation in 2017 that was really geared towards uh, growing jobs in the music industry. And I went to the state's economic development people and they're like, well, we don't know what to do with it. So then I went to Greater New Orleans Inc., which is our non-governmental economic development firm, and they took it on as one of the business sectors. They had grown the tech industry to a huge degree post-Katrina. And I'm like, it's the same thing, it's intellectual property. We have a lot of the pieces of this ecosystem. We need you to give us the legitimacy to be able to take this to the next level. So that's what we did. We created a multi-pronged plan. 
we worked with Sound Diplomacy, who did a year-long study for us. They identified about 25 different action items Go. that all got basically brought into these five different areas. And this is kind of where some of the examples that other uh, cities and, and regions can take, uh, you know, take advantage of. Many of these things are already in the works. We started this plan five years ago. We had like a two and a half year interruption with COVID, but we've started in earnest back on some of these items. Um, I have a separate slide for each one to go really quickly. Am I doing on time? Yeah, three, four minutes left? Okay, okay. Um, so under business development, basically this is we look at music conferences both going to and attracting as business development because the decision makers for companies, whether it's a record label or a management company, if we can bring them into New Orleans, we call it drinking the Kool-Aid. We can bring them in and make them understand our culture. It's the same thing here. I didn't really get Alaska until I come here, right? I think y'all have the same kind of things we have. When you come to New Orleans, it's so different than reading about it or being in a brochure. It's, and I think that's the case in many cities that, we, that are around the country and around the world. It's just you need to be able to understand it. You need to be able to feel it. And you can see where the opportunities are. Then we could talk about tax incentives, cost of living differentials, all these kind of things. So these are a number of things. Music FET is a, like a, a, fam, a fam tour kind of thing. When Jazz Fest happens, we invite a dozen or so of the executives that we know are in town. And we bring them to lunch. We bring them to studios. We show them that we do have that ecosystem here and that we could use your company to be here too. You know, you have a management company and you manage five of our artists. Why don't you open a shop here? We'll incentivize those, those jobs. You can sign 10 more bands from New Orleans and all of our business grows. You know, so those, that's kind of the mindset. Uh, another thing that we just created this for, for the first time this year is NOLA Music Con. And... For year one, we had 465 registrants from 22 states, as well as Canada and UK, and we're already working on year two. And um, those are all positive things moving us forward in the right direction. All right, did we go to the next one? No, I went the wrong way. So public policy, this is kind of the space that I'm most active in. Um, We've been real successful the last few years of really building those relationships in Baton Rouge. In the past few years alone, we've, been, we've passed these, these laws. Some are economic development oriented. Some of them are just protecting um, our artists and their creations. Um, we do an annual music advocacy day at the state capitol where I have members of the music community from every corner of the state come in and we get recognized in the Senate and the House. And it just gives us an opportunity to let them know that we are here, that we have an impact, and that you should support us. And then we come to them with specific legislation to be able to, um, to work with us to move it forward. Um, this year, in 2024, we're actually working with the state's Commerce Committee, and we're embarking on a statewide music study. And it's not really the same kind of study as the survey. It's, we calling it a music study. We have so many new legislators. We have a new governor. We have new chairs of all the committees. We have a new president of the Senate. We have a new president, uh, speaker of the House. So the study is really a, a smokescreen for us to have an opportunity to go meet with them in every corner of the state and talk about why music is important to their part of the state because it's everywhere in Louisiana. New Orleans is, you know, the big fight is it's New Orleans against the rest of the state. But we always have to talk about how there is great music coming from every corner of the state. And so by guising, you know, disguising it as a study resolution, uh, so luckily I'm good friends with the Chair of the Commerce Committee. She bought into it, and we're, uh, we just started that in October, and it's going to run through 2020. But at the same time, some of the incentives that we created in 2017, we have an opportunity in 2025 to, to tweak those incentives and move them forward and make them better. So that's part of the, the disguise of this music study. Um, some things that were part of the plan that have actually come to fruition. We now have a state-level music officer. She started last year, uh, my friend Lacey Chatagne. And we now, in New Orleans, have a nighttime economy office. We have a three-person three office that looks at not only the music, but restaurants. Because in a city like New Orleans, so much of the economic activity happens after dark. So that's a real important one for us. Uh, try and wrap these up really quickly. Maximizing existing assets. I couldn't fit hardly any of this on this page, but everything from 
Miked Up is a program, we got a quarter million dollar grant from economic development at the state level to actually create this, incent, uh, this internship program, I call it an internship program on steroids, where a kid that's in, a senior in college can get an internship with a management company or a booking agency, and they actually give them on-the-job training, and then that first year after they graduate, the grant pays for their salary for a year, and they build their network, and they build their book of business, and they can either make a decision at the end of that full two-year period of, do I stay with this company? Do I start my own company? Do they help me get placed with another company? So these are the kind of things, like, it goes beyond what you can learn in the classroom, and it really helps these kids. And some of them are just amazing, because we just graduated our first cohort last year. Second one just started this, uh, this current school year. And uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, other things, Music Trail, which is a year behind. It's Louisiana. But uh, the, the lieutenant governor has declared 2024 as the, the year of music for Louisiana. He was supposed to unveil the, uh, the Music Trail website on January 1st. It's January 13th, and no sign of it yet, but that's Louisiana. Um, but I was fortunate to be part of a a year and a half planning process that actually helped identify the right spots all over the state, right? Um, this I threw in here last night because I didn't even think about it until we had our little meeting last night, but for the last three mayoral candidates races, we've actually hosted a mayoral candidates forum where we actually had all the candidates running for mayor for our past three mayors, and we gave them questions strictly about music and what would you do to empower music to support it. and. Uh, it's, it's actually a great way to open their eyes to, wow, you know, there's some real stuff happening here. I need to be supportive of this. Uh, and this is one that's been really cool. There's more than this, but these are the two that I thought would be the most interesting. Is uh, We did a partnership, and I, miss, I didn't capitalize Guild, uh, with the Guild of Music Supervisors and the New Orleans Film Festival. This was the year right before COVID, and we're going to reinstitute it next year. We couldn't get it done the last couple of years, but... What we did was we, had a, we worked with a couple of nonprofits, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Ella Project, who actually did like a four-month course leading up to the film festival. And working with the Guild and uh, Miles and I's mutual friend, Jonathan McHugh, we brought in five music supervisors who were actually working on real-world projects. Each, five, each of the five gave us five projects, and we matched the ones who were looking for hip-hop. We matched them with hip-hop artists. If they were looking for soundtracky kind of music, we'd put them with some classical people. If they were looking for R&B, we... And 75 of our musicians were able to pitch their music on the weekend of the film festival, and 12... Oh, 12 that's, that's my two-minute warning. Uh, 12 of them got, got actual real... I mean, a couple of them got real placements. 12 of them got really sniffed out pretty well. The byproduct is... All of those music supervisors left saying, wow, I didn't realize New Orleans had all this different kinds of music, you know, because they think of us as like trad jazz, like some old museum piece, right? Um, another one that just happened this past October was we, host, we co-hosted, uh, co and the Grammys were a part of it, uh, put together through our songwriters and composers wing, a first ever New Orleans songwriting camp. And we brought some of the best songwriters from around the region to mi mix them with our songwriters, and they wrote 40 songs in five days, and one of the songs is in the color purple. So they, had, they brought in some music uh, supervisors and A&R folks who were looking for music right there on the spot, and uh, one of them is, is in that movie that just, got, that just came out, the remake, and it's uh, pretty amazing to see. Marketing, this is the biggest thing that we've always needed because getting the powers that be to take music seriously and that we should be marketing it has been one of my pet peeves. Elizabeth, who you'll hear from in a minute, and I both have degrees in public relations, and it, like, drives me crazy when we have this amazing set of resources or whatever right under our nose and the powers that be to take care of it. So we've done a whole bunch in this space. Uh, we've de we came up with a slogan for our initiative. We had the city declare October New Orleans Music Month. Um, that led to Billboard magazine. After five years of trying to get Billboard to write about New Orleans, they finally did in April of 2023. They did a multi-page spread on New Orleans and our growing music economy um, and some of the other things. 
one of the things that we're, we're doing during the Grammys, uh, the day bef two days before the Grammys is when we're in Los Angeles, is we're having an alumni reception with young alums who went to Loyola, Tulane, Xavier, Dillard, who live out in LA and work in the music industry, and we're gonna empower them to be our ambassadors so that when they hear of a company that's looking to expand and they're thinking about Atlanta or Houston, like, what about New Orleans? You know, so those are some of the things that we're really trying to push. And my final slide, this is the toughest one because building physical infrastructure, which is really important, is the toughest nut to crack um, because this really takes investment, it takes developers, but we've seen some progress. Um, one of the biggest things that we've always wanted to have is a true music hub. There are some great examples of them all over the country, all over the world. Tile Yard in London is the, probably the most amazing one, where there are recording studios and writing rooms and office buildings and all these things where the entire music ecosystem can be represented. And what happens in those kind of situations is what we call creative collisions, where this songwriter runs into this A&R person that, and talks to this manager, and next thing you know, they're working together on a project, right? And, and Marion talked about, you could be doing that here, right? This is kind of a hub right here. You know, we're in it. Y'all are here. That's what's really cool, right? We have new recording studios that open, opened in the last five years. There's two in the works right now. Uh, the, we actually have two record presses in New Orleans, believe it or not. One of them, the New Orleans record press, has just expanded. Bought two more presses from the Memphis mu <laughs> Music Press. I mean, record press. Um, but they're having lots of issues with getting the materials to make the vinyl. So we have a team of people that's working on how can we shorten that uh, or alleviate that um, supply chain issue. Um, we're, we have a major music museum, believe it or not, New Orleans, which a lot of, oh, I'm not going to say it, but New Orleans has had, you know, a huge impact on American music, and we don't have any museums in New Orleans that really are dedicated to our music. So there's a major project in the works there. Um, and in my friends, I just had lunch with this guy about a month ago, and he told me about this project. So we have a regional backline company that works in several cities across the South. And they're in the process of moving into a new building where they can build in, out some high-end rehearsal studios, which is something we desperately need in New Orleans. And they have the equipment that kind of, you know, if such and such band's coming through, they can come rent the place. They have access to all the stuff. So I just wanted to give you all like a snapshot of some of the things that we're doing in New Orleans. Uh, Marion was like, I really want, you know, don't tell us what to do. Show us some of the things y'all are doing and maybe we can walk away with some ideas. Um, so hopefully... There are some ideas. I'm around the rest of the day. I'm doing one of the office hours tomorrow. I think I'm over time, but thank you all so much. Hey, I'm here with Mara up from Portland. Um, tell us a little bit about what's going on in music in Portland. Absolutely. Um, we are right now, it being January, in the middle of Portland Music Month, which is, as far as I can tell, unique in the country. Mm -hmm. It is a month-long citywide multi-venue festival that really is about focusing the attention of the city on our music culture nice. um, in a very decided and fo in a real purposeful way, the business community to tie the, connect the, the dots for them to say, this is important and you want to stand with this because it's attractive for your employees to the tourism sector because it draws music tourism is the fastest growing mm -hmm. tourism trend and to the fans themselves to remind them with a $1 upcharge on the ticket that music doesn't just survive on their $10 cover charge, that we really need to be thinking about it as culture. And we're in our third year and it just keeps on growing. And I think it really has gotten its legs in the local imagination. January is Portland Music Month and that's what we're looking for. That's amazing. I love that you've gotten all these venues to cooperate on something, first of all, which is kind of a miracle. Um, mm -hmm. And so you add a dollar to the ticket and mm -hmm. how do you, what happens to that money then? Like, what do you use it for? All of it, 100% of it goes to the Echo Fund, which is one of our big Music Oregon initiatives um, to support 
independent music projects. There really isn't any project support for um, artists in popular genres. Mm -hmm. So um, in the first year, we were able to raise, I think, a little under $40,000. Uh, last year, we were able to give away nearly $60,000, and we're hoping to top $100,000 this year. Wow. And, and then, that's in grants for artists. Just... That's directly grants for artists. And what we're hoping to do is to use that as sort of proof of concept. We had more than $900,000 asked for it, for the Echo wow. Fund this year. And we we're only able to support, you know, 6% of that. So that by demonstrating the need, by demonstrating and kind of seeding the pot, we can mm -hmm. now go to other funding public sources and say, this is a culture that needs support. We're not just coming with our handout. We want matching money and we will mm -hmm. continue to grow these other funding sources. But this is a, a creative community that needs support. That's really fantastic. I love I love getting everyone together around this and focusing the city's attention on music for the whole month, just like big citywide celebration. Yeah. Um, there's something else you do that's really cool that I has totally lit a fire in me, and that is um, your music video project. Can you tell us about how that works? Yeah, Music Video Month. We were dumb. We made it at the same month as Mu Portland Music Month. We're going <laughs> to shift it. We're going to make, I've already got commitments. We're going to move it to February next year. <laughs> but what it is, is really trying to acknowledge some of the relationships, sort of sibling relationships between filmmakers, particularly independent filmmakers and independent musicians. Um, and the And so Music Video Month is the brainchild of an amazing fellow in um, our film community who negotiated out probably 40 different deep discounts on things like locations and um, stock video and rental of equipment and crew and all these different things. Many of these filmmakers spend their year making commercials and corporate films. So this is a real creative outlet for them that they're willing to come together and create something really incredible. So we do matchmaking events so that musicians can meet filmmakers. We do, um, we'll do a showcase of the resulting videos. Fine. I think we have three dozen videos being made in this month. Um, and it, they just have to be shot in this month. Post-production can happen later, but it's a really exciting program because I think it, it focuses a lot of that energy and create some sort of collective buying opportunities and all of these discounts. And the discounts weren't all necessarily local venues. We're negotiating more and more of them with like stock footed footage, um, stock video you can get from other places. So oh, wow. it, it could happen uh, statewide or in multiple cities. I could imagine mm -hmm. it working that way as long as you're bringing together these communities to get creative in January or That's February. So yeah, February in the future. Yeah, that's that's such a great creative challenge. Just like get together, make something. We're gonna make it easier. Here's a reason. Here's a, a oh. kind of a little nexus point that you can use oh. to like get together and and make something new. Um, yeah. I really, uh, you've helped us out a lot with um, collecting information on our own music community. You helped us with the uh, Alaska Music Census by way of your kind of Portland Music Census and now Oregon Music Census, and. Uh, what have you uh, what have you learned about the Portland music community over a few years of gathering that that information, that data? Like what has that helped you to communicate about your music scene? Yeah, it, it I think for too long, the popular music culture sort of defends itself because it's wonderful. And it is. We know it's wonderful, but that's not how policymakers think or talk. You need to have data. You need to have, um, you know, quotients that you can compare to other things so that they can kind of get their heads around how you fit. Um, so we have been um, doing a ton, just being able to say that we've got more than 14,000 unique recording acts that release new music in the five years prior to COVID from Oregon. You know, with nearly 10,000 of those from the Portland metro area. Um, we've got 1,200 music businesses. We've got, you know, more venues in Portland than they do in Austin or Nashville. Mm. These kinds of things, when you can give a number and compare it, 
to something else, which is why you and I have been working for years now on creating a Cascadia music index, you know, yeah. something that we can say, we may have fewer of this, but we've got more of that, which gives, <laughs> gives policymakers in any given place a way to kind of center in on the things that are distinct and, you know, maybe worthy of additional uplift or economic development. So if you have an amazing number of, um, you know, luthiers, people <laughs> making incredible instruments, being able to tell that story means you can get potentially economic development, attention, investment, and advantages for those businesses. Yeah. And what what does that like good economic investment or good policy look like as a as a closing question? Like what would your specific goals be um, now that you have this information? What would you like to make happen in policy and economic investment? There's a lot of policy discussion. You could have a whole conversation just about that. You know, there's noise code enforcement, there's livability, there's acoustic zoning, there are there's planning and sustainability and how you make sure that places that deliver culture remain in places that may become increasingly dense or that have new influx of population. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's about how do you, the film industry gets tax credits for productions that are done in the state? How do we look at analogs in other industries? And mostly because music is this broad reaching tendril thing. People have called mm -hmm. it the coral reef because mm -hmm. it supports so many other things, um, but it's fragile and it's threatened. Um, you know, people don't debate whether we should have green spaces in our in the places that we live. The only debate is how do we make them happen? How do we support them? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of ubiquity that we're hoping through our government relations, our music policy council and other things that we can really start to make a statewide and city value that music is vital. It's a cultural and economic imperative for us. And we're creating the numbers and galvanizing the community in a way that absolutely demonstrates it. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much for the ways that you all have been a role model and a help to us up here. <laughs> it's, we it's love being partners. I learn as much from you. <laughs> So thank you so much, Mira. Thanks to Music Portland and Music Oregon and your teams there. And uh, we can't wait to see you next year. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, I would also like to welcome our next keynote presenter, um, Elizabeth K. Wine, the founder of Music Export Memphis, and she's going to tell you a lot more about that. Um, she's also a PhD candidate from the School of Urban Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Memphis, and she is studying working class musicians in cities. So please welcome Elizabeth K. Wine. Hello. Um, also my first time in Alaska, so super excited to be here. I went dog sledding yesterday. It was fantastic. Um, yes, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to apologize for how quickly I'm about to talk and all the information I'm going to give you because um, just welcome to my brain for the next 20 minutes. And um, what I want to do is start kind of big picture and, and a little bit of sort of the theory of change and the ethos of how I got to the place where I am and how I built Music Export Memphis and the work that we do and why. Um, so we're going to start big. Uh, with some like big picture theoretical stuff we're going to narrow in and then I will get into the nitty gritty of what we do and, and what the impact has been. And I'm going to take this off. Maybe. There we go. Okay. So um, I talk and think a lot in my work about the middle um, and that takes shape in a few different ways, but we're going to start with a music middle class. What the heck is a music middle class and why do our cities need one? So um, it's not just middle class in the way that we typically think about that phrase, right? In terms of your earning and where you sit in uh, the socioeconomic space. Um, 
I tend to think about musicians in cities um, in a few different categories. There's sort of 10%, let's call it, that I call hub city seekers. These are folks who were always going to move. They were always going to leave. And I want to be clear that I'm talking about anywhere that's not an industry hub city, that's not New York, LA, Miami, Atlanta, Nashville. Um, so 10% of folks, they were always going to leave. Um, let's say 30% of folks are, I call them hobbyists and side hustlers, aka never movers. They're not going anywhere, but they're also not trying to make a living playing music. They're very happy to be making music as one small piece of their life. We love them. That's great. Um, and sorry, my fonts are crazy, so things look a little weird. But uh, this 60% in the middle is who I'm concerned about. That's who I wake up every day thinking about the music middle, right? Um, and they also tend to be the music middle class as well. But those are the folks who drive everything that I do and what I've built um, with Music Export Memphis. When a city has a thriving music middle class, uh, everyone stands to benefit. Um, we see benefits it's in tourism, in education, economic vitality, cultural you know, preservation and placemaking, social cohesion, live music brings us together, right? It builds community, it helps us get to know our neighbors, it makes places feel safer. There is an incredible body of academic literature and scholarship that proves all of these things. We don't need to spend a lot of time proving um, that music makes these impacts in our communities. Uh, the, the work is out there, the, that has been done. Um, so these, this idea of a music middle, the music middle class, and and those impacts that musicians have on cities is really what sort of undergirds our theory of change as an organization, as Music Export Memphis. So this is our mission statement. We create opportunities for and subsidize working musicians in cities uh, so that they can go out into the world and build audiences outside the city and sustain their careers. Now, this is the theory of change. So essentially for those who are not in the nonprofit world and nonprofit speak, what that means is it's essentially a big version of, uh, a, of a vision statement, right? So if we do our job well, what is true is blank, right? How we make change um, and what that looks like. And so we say if we support our musicians in creating opportunities for them to go outside the city, we subsidize their career, we help them to build audiences in other places, um, what happens in Memphis is that Memphis is a city of choice for musicians and that a few things are true when that's true, that we have more vibrancy, that we have better music engagement and education for our young people, that our city's character is preserved, and very importantly, this last one, that Memphis is nationally competitive for talent. Um, we've built a lot of our uh, funding opportunities off of the impact that a vibrant creative community can have on talent attraction, um, also on tours. But there are a lot of folks, when we think about that economic impact, a lot of what Reed was talking about, being able to speak to the decision makers in a language that not only they understand, but that they like, um, that they get excited about. The economic impact is one piece of it, but helping them to understand that um, music is one of the things that's going to make people want to move to your city uh, and bring talent to your city, that's big. Um, so... Continuing with our theory of change, right? How do we create economic vibrancy? We invest in artists, which leads them to invest in small businesses that power the music ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. We raise the creative ceiling of the music ecosystem by offering artists pathways to build networks out the sides of the city and opportunities for international exchange. This is a big one. I'll pause here for just a second because when I started the work that became Music Export Memphis, I did like an informal survey, um, truly just through my personal Facebook page, like six or seven years ago, asking folks uh, to tag an artist who'd left our city. And I asked them four questions. When did you leave? Where did you go? Why did you leave? And what would it take for you to come back? And what I thought I would hear, because what we were really starting to hone in on with the development of Music Export Memphis was opportunity. This word, I'll say it a lot, that we need opportunity for artists here. I thought they would say there weren't opportunities for me. And they did say that. But a lot of people said, I reached a creative ceiling in Memphis, and so I had to go somewhere else to sort of find more creative opportunity. And that really surprised me, because we have an unbelievable community of incredibly talented musicians. And I sort of thought, well, that's enough, right? There's just a ton of talented people here, so therefore, iron sharpens iron, and those creative opportunities will be there. But it's not that simple. And so a lot of what we do and think about now with Music Export Memphis is how what we are accomplishing by getting these artists outside the city is actually raising the creative ceiling for everyone by connecting and, and building pathways. Um, so, okay, so why export, right? Um, 
this first one feels really important to me. Uh, one city or market alone is not enough to sustain an artist's career, period. End of story. I, that's true here. That's true in Memphis. That's true in New Orleans. That's true in any other city. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to physically tour, though certainly that is the path that, that is most prevalent. But you're going to make money from people streaming or downloading or buying your music outside of your city. You're going to make money from people buying your merch outside of your city or you're going to place something in film or television. You're going to make money outside of your market if you're going to make a living as a musician. You have to build audiences elsewhere. Um, and that's true everywhere else. And, and these things are sort of, you know, this, again, why export is sort of as I was building Music Export Memphis, what are these things that are driving this decision to focus on this? Um, this fundamental belief in the power of music and culture to attract talent, and of course, the unique value proposition benefiting artists and cities. Hello, hello, it's not going. Oh, there it goes, cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially, what I really believed when I started Music Export Memphis in 2015 was that there was a real opportunity that we were missing. My, I'm a recovered publicist, as I like to say. I ran my own PR agency for about 10 years, and I worked primarily with Americana and Roots music artists based in Memphis, so some outside the city. I was traveling a lot to festivals, conferences, etc., and I saw a real opportunity that Memphis was missing out on. I saw some cities showing up and not doing it very well. And I also saw that there was a space for us to support our artists in getting to these festivals and that they would be the ambassadors that we needed um, to sort of drive home the message that Memphis is a contemporary music city. So I just saw a lot of opportunity um, that we had, again, music heritage, we had a vibrant music scene, we had all of this stuff, but we needed to take an innovative approach that created real value for our artists. Um, that part feels really important. The phrase I use most often is meaningful value. You, um, because there are a lot of times where we can do something with artists that we say creates value, like, oh, come and showcase at South by Southwest. Here's this stage for you to showcase. We're creating this opportunity for you. But is it meaningful? Um, what's actually happening for them? Who's in the audience? Are they getting in front of someone who's actually going to be able to drive their career forward? Is it media? Is it industry? You know, are they building fans? But we're, we're doing something that maybe benefiting the city, um, but it's not necessarily benefiting the artists in a meaningful way. So that's a, a real key, right? This innovative approach that says we have the heritage, we have the contemporary scene, we have artists who are touring, so how do we create opportunities for them that are really meaningful? Um, and this really just sort of, you know, underscores kind of what I was talking about, that we, that what I saw was that we had these artists who were touring. We also had artists who were leaving the city um, and they were leaving because they needed to find opportunity somewhere else. Sorry, I combined a lot of different PowerPoints to make this. So I apologize. There's some repetition in here. But so what you, what you end up coming up with is... Music Export Memphis. Um, the first organization that I went to when I started uh, MEM in 2015 was actually our Chamber of Commerce. Because I really felt like if I could get, again, stop me if you've heard this before, the economic folks on our side, um, that we would be able to make a case for supporting the work more broadly. And sure enough, they did uh, buy in very quickly. They understood um, you know, what I wanted to do. And so uh, we brought the chamber to the table. We brought tourism to the table early on and started building um, very slowly this organization that now sort of sees our role um, you know, in, in two ways, right? supporting and strengthening our artists locally, and then promoting and sending them out into the world. We kind of sit right in the middle of that Venn diagram. Um, and we do it through three programs now. And uh, and I'll, I'll pause and take a brief step back to just say that we, as I said, started the work in 2015. We were sort of slowly growing, doing a showcase, you know, here and growing it to another showcase the next year, launching our, our artist granting program, and then COVID hit. And we were still a relatively small organization. Um, in 2019, our annual, our revenue for that year was $68,000. In 2020, our revenue was $376,000 because we were tapped to run an artist emergency relief fund. Um, we were already set up to grant to individuals. We had the trust and the relationships within our music community. And some of our larger arts funders said, 
we've got to get this money out the door. Okay, Music Export Memphis, you're the one that's going to help to, you know, facilitate this granting to individuals. And it changed everything for us. Um, obviously, our revenue quadrupled, but also our individual donor base quadrupled overnight as well. And we spent the last now almost four years um, working to sort of keep those folks in the fold and to build in a way that is sustainable on what was really, really catalytic growth for us uh, in 2020 and 2021. And I'll get to some of the actual, the sort of numbers of how much money we sent out the door here in a second as well. But these are our three programs now. Experiences, Ambassadors, and the Export Bank. So Experiences is the first thing we ever did, which is the way I define it now is anything where we as an organization are going outside the city and we're producing an event. Um, oh, Siri. Yeah, Siri can hear me. Um, we're, go we're going outside the city and we're producing an event that is trying to create a holistic Memphis experience and we're putting music at the center. So we go to Folk Alliance International every year and bring um, Memphis artists. We, we are going back to South by Southwest this year for the first time. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we go to Americana Fest in Nashville every year. We're going to North by Northeast for the second year in Toronto. So we're, we're building showcases and parties and events at these festivals that feature these Memphis artists. Under the experiences heading, we also create cultural exchanges. Um, the biggest one we ever did was with Liverpool. We did that in 2017. Um, it was a songwriting exchange that was really cool, sort of uh, placed these artists in historic spaces in both cities to co-write. And then we did uh, public performances at the close of both of those, of the sort of the time in, in Liverpool and in Memphis. And we're building more of those in 2024. So that's all the experiences. Ambassadors is now all of our individual grant making. So this was program started in 2018 as tour grants. That is still the, the biggest um, amount of money that goes out the door in our individual grants is tour grants. It's really straightforward. I felt really strongly that musicians were already going on the road around the world every night saying, we're so-and-so and we're from Memphis, Tennessee, because they would be absolutely insane not to. Um, apologies to everyone, but Memphis is the coolest city on the planet. And if you did not say, if you're from Memphis and you didn't say you were from Memphis, you were just nuts, right? They were all already doing this. Um, and they were proud of their connection to our city. So they were already representing and promoting where they were from. We just needed to really empower them and mobilize them and also make it possible for them to tour more effectively and more efficiently to do it more, to do it better, and to really know that their city had their back. So that's where our tour support started. Um, so the ambassador program initially was tour grants, and we still do them. If you have five or more tour dates confirmed outside the city, you can apply for a grant from us fi between $500 and $2,500. There's a $5,000 annual cap, um, but you can apply multiple times. So if you do sort of, you know, a spring, a summer, and a fall tour, you can get funding from us for all of them. And uh, and you have sort of some like requirements that you have to complete. You've got to do some social posting. There's some hashtags we ask you to use. You sign a grant agreement with us, but it's also very simple. We also believe really fundamentally that artists are not grant writers, that we don't have an expectation that they are or should be. And so our application, our, the sort of rules for entry are very straightforward. Um, the application is very simple. You know, we've said we want to support you as a touring artist. So just give us your tour information and let's go from there and we'll get the dollars in your pocket. Um, and so through the years, we've now built onto the ambassador program to have several different individual granting lines. The one potentially that I'm maybe most proud of is called our merch fund. Uh, so we provide micro grants to Memphis artists to create physical merchandise and as long as they do it with a Memphis based business. So if you are pressing t-shirts, you can come to us, you submit your invoice, you submit like a mock-up of what you're going to create. Um, and we also ask artists to tell us a little bit about what the return is going to be. So, hey, here are my t-shirts. Um, they're going to cost like $8.75 each to make. I'm planning to sell them for $20. Here's how many I've got. Like, um, this is what I'm thinking about the total return on investment for me. And we provide a grant up to 50% of the cost of that merchandise that we pay directly to the provider. And we've got receipts, which I'll show you in a second, on how much money that has kept in our local ecosystem. Um, and we know that that a lot of these artists are spending with local businesses and they would have spent online because they tell us, right? They're like, I would have just ordered this from 
whateverprint.com, but you said you were going to give me money, so now I'm, I'm buying local. So we also know these are new dollars that are coming into our city and that are staying in our city. Um, and it impacts an artist's bottom line. Um, so, you know, when I don't have to tell you all, right? When you're gigging and when you're touring, who knows what you're going to make per gig? Who knows if it's going to be a guarantee, if it's going to be a door deal, what that's going to look like. But you have some control over what happens at that merch table to an extent, right? And you have control with, with this support. You can have even more control over sort of your costs and how, again, how you can, uh, you know, impact that bottom line through these grants. So we have several different other um, individual grants that live in ambassadors, but then our third program is called the Export Bank. This really grew the last couple of years out of uh, what I was recognizing that there were artists who had opportunities that were coming their way. This just sort of didn't slot into these other two buckets, but they were amazing opportunities that they could not take advantage of without some help. So perfect example, this artist right here is a phenomenal talent named Taliba Safia. You absolutely should look her up and listen to all of her music. She has an incredible record coming out this year called Black Magic. Um, Taliba uh, got an invitation through some connections that she had made to go to Los Angeles and be in the songwriter's room for an HBO show called Rap Shit, which is under East Issa Rae's produ production company. Um, and she called me and she said, I got this opportunity. I can't afford to go to Los Angeles, um, but I need to afford to go to Los Angeles. And we said, cool, we will pay for your plane ticket and uh, get you an Airbnb. And she went and now she has placed three songs in the show, been invited to another writer's room and has created relationships that will result in intellectual property money, right? That she got she got paid um, as part of that songwriter's camp, but she's also going to get paid hopefully for a really long time off of what she did um, in that in that space, and she wouldn't have been able to do it without our support. So that's really what the Export Bank is about, is just us being able to say yes to these opportunities that artists have um, that don't kind of fit into anything else. So uh, so what are some of our results? 240,000 plus. This was fun because I updated this just the other day with our end of 2023 numbers. So these are all a lot bigger than they used to be. It's very exciting. This is how much we've awarded ambassador grants since the launch of the program in July of 2018. So that's, that's everything that is the tour grants, the merch fund, and we have industry scholarships that we give out as well. We have a new program called Ambassador Access as of 2021 that creates pipelines to touring for uh, black and brown artists and women identifying artists um, to try to uh, make up for the fact that the vast majority of our ambassador grant recipients in 2019 were, as I always say, and my board laughs at me, white dudes noodling on guitars. And so um, we needed to compensate for that. No offense to any white dude who noodles on a guitar. I'm married to a white dude. He's great. Um, but yeah, we we wanted, we wanted to, to try to make up for that because that does not look or sound like the city of Memphis. So we're, we're building some programs that can do that. So 240 grand out the door. Also keep in mind, those programs were largely largely shuttered between 2020 and 2022. So that's really, um, you know, kind of two and a half years of true activity for some of those grants. Um, 77,000 plus, that is the n amount that our merch fund recipients spent with Memphis-based businesses just last year. Uh, and that is the amount they've spent with Memphis-based businesses since the launch of the merch fund in 2021. And those numbers really talk. And it's super simple. Again, we literally just we have the invoices, you know, we just track it. It's like, we know what we're going to give you for this grant. And we also know what you're spending with this business. Um, and we add it up and we can really talk about, uh, you know, an impact that, that is happening that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, this is the amount that we paid out to musicians through our COVID relief grants between 2020 and 2022, um, almost, you know, well, over $450,000, uh, and this, I think this is maybe my last slide, um, maybe, yeah. So this is a, this is a big one, and I'll, I'll kind of end here. And as Reed said, I'm going to be around the rest of the day. I'm here for office hours tomorrow. I'd love to talk to you more about any of our work, but especially this. After our COVID, uh, our big COVID relief um, first round, we sort of saw some things that we couldn't unsee because we had asked artists to write down in the application exactly how many gigs had been canceled and how much money they had lost from those gigs. And some things that we knew anecdotally just came to light in a way that was 
on paper, um, which is that most of our musicians were being paid about $100 uh, a person a gig. And those were people who were making the entirety of their living from music. And it was really distressing. And so our advocacy work, our ongoing advocacy, advocacy work grew out of that. And one of the big wins that we have had is that we have instituted our own minimum per musician per gig rate, which is $250. And we now have partners, multiple partners coming on board in the city to commit to better employment practices, essentially, and to fair pay for musicians. And the work continues this year. My goal um, and what we've started on is working on an artist-friendly venue certification. So uh, this advocacy piece has has started to, to really grow in the last couple of years. But getting our downtown Memphis commission, so uh, who activates spaces across downtown throughout the year and pays musicians to commit to increase to what we said was a, you know, a, a better minimum. I mean, we should all be also be doing better than 250, but when we were doing a hundred, um, this is a pretty significant leap. So now uh, we do have a lot of focus on this advocacy piece in Memphis and just trying to improve conditions for um, Memphis artists. And I know that I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk about this, but our artists represent our city every day um, and they do it really well and we track it. I'd love to talk to you more about it. So thank you all so much for having me. Uh, and I, yeah, look forward to speaking to each of you. Hey, get ready to stretch. We are about to take a lunch break right after I tell you one or two quick things with my other slides. Um, uh, first of all, we are, today is the sit and learn stuff. Um, tomorrow is the we actually get to talk about it stuff. Um, tomorrow that's happening um, at, in, at UAA um, in the student union, the den, which is the really, gorgeous new room, newer room of the student. If you haven't been there in a while, you should go. It's beautiful. The UAA Department of Music, UAA Department of Music is partnering with us to let us use this space. Uh, Mari Han, we have huge thanks for her and for Grant for that. Um, and uh, we're hosting a bunch of UAA students tomorrow too as a result, and probably some today. But um, being in that space, we're going to do something called office hours. Um, hey, John, could I get my... There we go. Yes, that's it. I've made a slide and everything. Um, office hours. Um, what that means is we've got a couple of subject matter sort of experts at the table. Um, the list of names is staggering, but also we know there's a lot of other subject matter experts who could easily talk just as authoritatively about the same thing. Um, we're simply gathering in a space where you can find a person and talk to them about what you want to talk about, whether it's music, Memphis Music Export, whether it's more Recording Academy in New Orleans, whether it's all of our Alaskan experts we're going to hear in the second half telling us about what's going on here, as well as folks, I mean, I won't tell you the list. Look at the list. It's on our website. It's great. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you know that's going on tomorrow. Um, I also have some homework for you over lunch. It's very easy homework. Um, we are now collating over lunch the biggest list we can here in the room and on Zoom. We want to know on a post-it or in post-it length language, what have you tried that worked? What have you seen that worked? What was that technique, the way you figured out how to teach that technique to your students that worked for them finally? What is um, the thing you did at a gig that doubled the take in the tick jar? What is the way you collaborated with another group to make something happen or did a cross-disciplinary exercise? What was the open mic where you figured out how it locked in? What worked for you? What would you tell another musician just starting out or struggling? How would you encourage them? Um, we like to complain when we get together. I know this because I've had 700 conversations that include the word taproot every time I come back to Anchorage and talk to other musicians. Um, and that's fine. That's valid. We need those discussions. We need to share our collective grief over this or that or this or that missed opportunity. Um, but I've had a lot of those discussions, and right now what I want to know is what worked for you. So we got a ton of post-its out there. We got markers. Um, we've got some places to put the post-its. I want you to do that during lunch. And if you're not a post it person or you don't want to fight through the crowd of the pizza, uh, go ahead and go to this site. Um, that is going to be a place you can do it. Just fill in a simple form. If you're on the Zoom, fill it in. We're going to collate some of the answers and look at them after lunch, and we're also going to send every single answer to you guys in the follow-up email next week. Um, that is your homework. Um, if you can't think of anything nice to say, um, I want you to know that we think that is valid and valuable. And my, come on, clicker, there we go. One more slide. You can do it, baby. Come on. John, could you hook me up there? 
Thanks. Just one more slide. Yes. Okay, there we go. We also have a well of despair, also known as a trash can. If you really need to get it out of your system, please do. That is valid as heck. And then throw it in the well of despair and write a song about it. Um, uh, you can also go to typeintothevoid.com. It's shockingly therapeutic. Um, we'll have those discussions about the problems on another day. But for now, I want to hear from you guys over lunch what works. We're going to read out some of those answers after um, we collate them over lunch. But for now, we have pizza. We have um, many other foods. Thank you so much to Moose's Tooth for giving us a whole bunch of free pizza. And thank you to our volunteers who are trying to keep them hot, even though we had to get them a little bit ago. So if your pizza is still warm, thank our incredible volunteer crew. Um, we're going to watch some videos and take a break for lunch. Ooh. Find your spot and we will get rolling. John, go ahead and roll us. Hello, my name is Achiungo Tagalim, and I'm the creative director of the Ock Rock Music Festival. And on behalf of the Ock Rock team, we would like to express a huge to everyone who helped make the festival a huge success, from the amazing musicians who shared their gifts and music, to the volunteers, our community partners, to our generous supporters the support staff of Tlingit and Haida, and the Juno Arts and Humanities Council, and most importantly of all, to all of you that came out to witness three nights of indigenous excellence. Over the course of three extraordinary days, history was made, as indigenous musicians from around the world gathered to share their incredible talents. Ak Rock embodies the traditional tribal values, hold each other up, a reflection of the collaborative partnership between Klinget and Haida and the Juno Arts and Humanities Council. This commitment to fostering cultural diversity and promoting indigenous artists has left an indelible mark on the music industry that will echo for generations to come. We hope that all of you will join together with us as we look forward to Ock Rock 2025, endeavors that will further uplift and empower indigenous excellence. At the southern end of the Richardson Highway, nestled on a strategically chosen corner in Valdez, Alaska, you will find Magpies on the Fly. Magpies has grown from its original nest as a small brick and mortar bakery that hosted quaint gatherings for individual acoustic musicians over 16 years ago into a food truck and outdoor venue that now hosts multiple events, dinner theater, and over a dozen large bands each summer. Over a decade of trials and locations, we have settled into our current nest and began to dream big and lean hard into the investing of the growth of our rural Alaska performing arts culture. 2023 was our fifth year of this, and we began to see some traction. Magpies has successfully created products that connect our community and its visitors through food, art, and entertainment. This mission began with creating and growing a nonprofit production group, The Far North Follies, then partnering with them to bring dinner theater and historical comedy written, produced, and performed by locals to our Magpie stage. Our end of the road concert series is in its third year and beautifully growing. We began this project by bringing a professional audio engineer and musician on board, purchasing the correct equipment for her to do her job and providing her with the space and budget to create a performance experience that all musicians have enjoyed and felt honored to be a part of. Last year, we grew even more when we were able to collaborate with our neighbors in McCarthy and Chitna, providing the musicians with a smooth weekend of adventure and paid performances along the Richardson Highway. We have been developing a business model that holds a product on the stage equally as important as the product in the cafe menu. In doing so, we have created many jobs and contract work opportunities for writers, musicians, and performers to truly embrace their art and take a risk on themselves. It has been an absolute privilege to be able to provide paid opportunities to the performers and a unique Alaskan experience in rural Alaska for our viewers. I think it's really fun to be growing up around all of this, knowing that someday I can also help. And I love that there's a place in Valdez where we can just go sing and dance on stage and you don't have to worry about anyone judging you. It's just there for you to have fun. Hey everybody, we are Luna and Ursus from Homer, Alaska. 
Um, we had a good year. We released our first recording project, a uh, five song EP. And uh, we traveled around playing a bunch. We actually doubled the amount of gigs we had played the previous year uh, from 30 to 70, all in Alaska, mostly on the Kenai Peninsula. And our best, most enjoyable, largest crowd that we played to was at the Leva Amp Series in Soldotna, opening for Pipeline Vocal Project. And that was amazing. Big crowd, great sound system. Yeah, it was good. And uh, now we're just working on some new singles with a new producer right here in Homer. And we're super stoked about getting those out, cranking that Spotify algorithm and just growing our fan base. And just looking for new gigs, playing new places, playing more places. We just want to just keep playing more and more and- Always. Yeah. Oh, hi, my name is Finester. I am a local singer and songwriter here in Anchorage. And I specialize in R&B, soul, gospel, and OPM, which is Filipino music. I had the very opportunity of making my debut performance this year at the R&B Live back in April with Be Bad Production and the privilege of being a part of the Ock Rock Festival fundraiser back in May, which I met so many wonderful people with the guidance of Engville and Andrea. And it's been such an adventure being a part of um, the Anchorage music industry. And it's been just such a blessing for me. And I was recently signed actually with Be Bad Productions, booking and management under the mentorship of Andrea Antoine. And I am looking forward to so many projects uh, in 2024. And I would like to formally invite you to my debut concert with my fellow artist, Jazzy Tungia, in March 9, and I would love to see you there. And lastly, I just want to wish everyone a good day at the Alaska Music Summit. Maraming salamat and mabuhay. Hey everybody, my name is Dave Emmert, and I am the host of the radio program Alaska's Fresh Catch. It's a weekly music program heard on seven stations across the state that focuses on new music, with a special spotlight on music coming out of Alaska. Now, 2023 was a big year. We built the show. Uh, we've done over 40 interviews, done a bunch of specials, and even took it on the road uh, and did a show down in Sitka. That was a lot of fun. So 2024 is going to be a lot of the same, but bigger and better, so stay tuned for that. But I thought it was important to participate in the Alaska Music Summit because I wanted to be a resource for the folks attending as a broadcaster. So um, if you're an Alaskan musician, by all means, I'd love to hear your music. If you're working on a music or music adjacent project, drop me a line. I'd love to chat about it on air. And even if you have questions about the radio side of the music industry, happy to answer those questions or point you in the right direction as well. So that said, big thank you to Marion and everybody over at Akimi and Music Alaska for all their hard work for the summit. And I'll see you guys in the rest of 2024. Hey, Alaska Music Summit. I'm Zane Penny. Um, I'm a local uh, singer and songwriter from Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I'm visiting family <laughs> out of state right now. That's, that's why I'm not wearing a, a winter coat. But uh, 2023 was the best year of my life musically and just in every in every way um i went on my first tour with ashley young and huss i released my first album uh produced by huss myself and james glaives james glaives did most of the mixing on that one um i played sundown solstice festival that was awesome and 2024 is gonna be insane i'm looking forward to that um i have another tour planned for may bunch of shows shows lined up um so yeah i'm stoked to still be doing stuff and i'm stoked to be a part of this thanks for watching oh, hi my name is finester i am a local singer and songwriter here in anchorage and i specialize in r&b soul gospel and opm which is filipino music I had the very opportunity of making my debut performance this year at the R&B Live back in April with Be Bad Production and the privilege of being a part of the Ock Rock Festival fundraiser back in May, which I met so many wonderful people with the guidance of Engville and Andrea. And it's been such an adventure being a part of um, the Anchorage music industry. And it's been 
just such a blessing for me. And I was recently signed actually with Be Bad Productions, booking and management under the mentorship of Andrea Antoine. And I am looking forward to so many projects uh, in 2024. And I would like to formally invite you to my debut concert with my fellow artist, Jazzy Tamiya, in March 9. And I would love to see you there. And lastly, I just want to wish everyone a good day at the Alaska Music Summit. Maraming salamat and mabuhay. Hey everybody, my name is James Glaves. I'm a musician slash artist slash producer based out of Anchorage, Alaska. 2023 was a great year for me. I released nine solo singles under my band name Glaves. I collaborated with a bunch of other artists and I also got the chance to produce some really cool artists, some being known as Zane Penny, Sundog, Bethlehem Shalom, and many, many others. And I'm hoping to do more of that in 2024. I also had a first this year. I got a placement on HBO for a show called Gossip Girl for one of my songs that I wrote several years back. That was very, very exciting. I filmed my very first music video as a solo artist this summer for my song called Dance Machine. It's really crazy and fun and silly. And um, I'm hoping to do another one here really soon, hopefully in February for another one of my new songs. And that was definitely a highlight of 2023. So thank you for uh, taking the time to check out this video. Peace. Hi, my name is Mark Manners. I'm a guitarist, composer, and educator based in Anchorage, Alaska. 2023 was a great year for me. I had the pleasure of playing with Grammy Award-winning drummer and composer Mark Walker in the Alaska Jazz Workshop faculty concerts. In the concerts, we featured original compositions by all the faculty members including my song, Journey to Forever. Having the opportunity to play with Mark Walker, John Damberg, the rest of the AJW faculty, Rick Zelensky, and all the other great musicians I got to play with in 2023 has helped me take the next step in becoming the guitarist and musician I want to be. For more information, visit my website at markmanners.com. Um, I am going to be brief in uh, announcing our next segment, which is more of people doing stuff that worked and telling us about it. Our next guest needs very little introduction if you have any Anchorage history. Um, and so I'm going to let him introduce himself. Everybody, please welcome Mr. White Keys. <laughs> Okay, fabulous. Oh, man, it's good to see all you uh, here today. I mean, all the cool guys are here. This is really cool. Um, okay, so I'm Mr. White Keys, and uh, let's see here. We got a, uh, we got a, okay, we're going to start. All right. So, <laughs> the magic of PowerPoint. All right. <laughs> So I'm Mr. White Keys, and what they wanted here at the Music Summit was somebody who was a brilliant musician and hilariously funny, and until that person comes along, you're going to have to settle for me. <laughs> so this segment is about, you know, what works, and, um, you know, how can you be more successful in the music business, uh, you know, get bigger crowds, more money, and it's all summed up by the old-time comedian George Burns, who said... It's a pleasure going broke in a business that you love. <laughs> now, you, we, we all know that uh, you know, the music business is not all about money. I mean, we're not basically in it for the money. We're in it for a good time and to play the music that we do. Um, but, you know, you, you want to take advantage of what, what you can do. All right, so all of you, I mean, we started playing here back in the, uh, in the night, uh, where, which, uh, right here, right? we got a touchy button here. All right, oh, I'm using the big button, okay. So we started out here in the 70s, uh, you know, 50 years ago in Anchorage uh, playing music, and, and basically everybody in this room can play circles around me. I mean, I, I'm just a hack musician, and we, uh, you know, did what we did by making snotty comments and rude remarks, and that's, you know, where we got to where we are today. 
Um, but you can all play circles around me, but why is it that we figured out, or didn't even figure out, but uh, we figured out, you know, how to sell out virtually every show for 35 years. And it was a miracle. I mean, it, it, I, I, I not quite, there wasn't any plan. It just sort of happened, and we learned stuff along the way. So what I'd like to do here is to, um, all right, to share a little bit with you about uh, 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 about what you know what what worked for us and what happened and. The thing is that uh, we're going to do this, we can't do this in 15 minutes, but they, they, we're going to actually, Marion has set up a Zoom later on in March where we're going to go into this in detail and talk about what works and what doesn't. Okay, the music business is changing so fast it'll just make your head spin. I mean, in the old days, in, in the 70s when you started, the only place you could hear rock and roll was in a bar or in a concert or on the radio. I mean, there was no rock and roll on TV. I mean, it, at that point, it was still like renegade stuff, and, and it just it was not available. Well, okay, so what happened was that in the 80s, we got MTV, and there was more rock and roll on, uh, on TV, and that started to grow until we got into... Man, the big okay. Oh, all right. Well, here. Well, let's go. Let's go back there. And and, and now we we get into a thing where every TV show has a rock and roll soundtrack. Movies have rock and roll soundtracks. Late night shows have rock and roll house bands and guests. There's rock and roll on streaming, on cable, on Netflix, on on YouTube. It's everywhere. And what does that mean for you? Well, it means something really. Uh, pretty incredible. And that is that you are no longer in competition with other local bands. You're not in competition with Blackwater Railroad or, or the Sugar Strings or Nervous Rex. They're all great bands. And, but, and music is not all about competition. It's not about competition at all. It's about collaboration. But y you are actually in competition nowadays with guys like Beyonce, Taylor Swift, the Rolling Stones, Elton John, you were in direct competition with those guys because your audience can see these guys anytime they want. They can just turn on YouTube, they can turn on streaming, they can see them for free. There's no cover charge. They're not paying for expensive drinks. They're going to the refrigerator and getting a six pack. I mean, they can see these guys and you have to do something about that in order to not look like a complete monkey when you go on stage. I mean, these guys have got a bigger budget. I mean, it Taylor Swift took in $305 million on one tour. I mean, it's incredible. And, you know, your audience is seeing these guys as well. Okay, so it's show business. These guys know about show business, and they are all exploiting it to the max, and that's why... They're getting $305 million on a tour. A lot of musicians are resistant to the idea of show business. They think, oh, I'm not going to sell out my art. It's not about selling out your art. It's about enhancing your art. I mean, even if you paint a masterpiece, you do the Mona Lisa, it looks better in a good frame than it does if it's just nailed up to the wall. So that's what we're talking about here. And years ago, I read one sentence that really drilled this into me. This is, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And, and it's something like that I've never seen before or since, okay? So there was a guy back, uh, you know, this is 90 years ago in the 1930s. And is and what, man, we, okay, his name was Saul Hurok. And he said, I don't present concerts. I present extravaganzas. Okay, and he wasn't a promoter or a producer. He was an impresario. I mean, he, he even applied this to his own title. 
You know, and that's show business. I mean, you've got to do everything bigger than life. And it's about enhancing what you do. You're going to do what you do anyway. Okay? I mean, you're in the music business to play music and uh, to have a good time. But it's better to have 200 people out there than it is to have six. You know, I mean, you want to expose what you're doing to as many people as possible. And all the big-time guys know about show business, okay? Um, we gotta, okay, all the big-time guys are using these techniques, and it didn't just happen by accident. They studied it, they learned the tricks of the trade, and there are tricks in any business. There are tricks of the trade, and it is, you want to learn those. And one example was Motown. Okay, now we, uh, we've got Motown here somewhere. Man, we, okay, so Motown had some of the greatest artists of all time. I mean, they had the Supremes, they had Stevie Wonder, they had Marvin Gaye, they had the Temptations. These guys were some of the greatest talents in the history of rock and roll. But Motown also had a school. And if you were a Motown artist, you had to go to this school. It was like a charm school, a finishing school. And they, all their stars had to go to this school. They had to learn how to act on stage, how to talk on stage, how to do an interview, how to dress to go to the grocery store, how to act when you signed autographs for people. And nothing was left to chance. I mean, you think that these guys reached their status that they're at, that they have just because of their talent. That's not true. I mean, they had a school of, of uh, you know, how to, how to be in show business. So how do you make more money? Well, Taylor Swift figured it out. So one of the first things you want to do is realize You've got to work together with the clubs. If you're, and I'm talking about, you know, we're just talking about here, here in Anchorage and local clubs. You've got to work together because the club owners, if you make, if your band makes more money for them, you're in a position to ask for more of that for yourself. Okay, if you make the same, you draw the same crowd that everybody else does. Well, why are they going to pay you more than anybody else? They're, they're just not. So it's a collaborative effort. It's a joint. It's a it's a it's a joint venture. The club owner is not your adversary. You should be working with a club owner, and the club owner is just the middleman, because really the audience is paying your rent. Okay, the minute you leave your garage rehearsal space and you go in front of an audience, you've got an audience and everything changes. You've got to give that audience everything and more. You've got to give them more than they expect. You've got to pull out all the stops to make what you're doing seem totally irresistible to the audience. You're creating an illusion. You're making the audience think you're cool. You can't tell the audience you're cool because the first rule of being cool is you don't ever say you're cool. I mean, you just can't do that. But every big time act does this and every big time act knows this. Okay, so we'll take the Ramones. The Ramones are usually cited as being the first punk rock band. They were not only a punk rock band, they were the punkiest of the punk rock bands. They were rebels, they were renegades, they were outlaws, okay? I mean, they defied every rule that anybody was using in the performing industry up until then. Okay, but what did Joey Ramone say? Some, bland, some bands blow it before they even play. The most important moment of any show is when the band walks out with the red light, amp lights glowing, the flashlight that shows each performer the way to his spot on the stage. It's crucial not to blow it. It sets the tempo of the show. It affects everyone's perception of the band. Now, all the mental notes I had been taking over the years came into play. No tuning up on stage. Synchronized walk to the front of the stage and back again. Joey standing up straight, glued to the mic stand for the whole set, keeping it really symmetrical. It was a requirement we adopted, a regimen that started immediately when we hit the stage to make sure you immediately go into the song and not lose that excitement before you even start. 
okay, these are the punkiest of the punk bands, but they know the rules of show business, okay? And they're using those rules to create the illusion that you are going to look at them and think these are the coolest guys in the world. I want to come back and see these guys again. I want to buy all their records. It's the illusion they're creating. Okay, down in New Orleans, there's a Queen Ida. Well, she's from Lake Charles, but all right. But we'll call her from New Orleans just because you're here. All right. So Queen Ida plays Zydeco. If, 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 if those of you that don't know, Zydeco is like just about the most exciting music on the planet. I mean, it's incredible. It's usually an accordion and a fiddle and washboard plus bass and drums. And I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, so Queen Ida came up here. We, we got Queen Ida up here at the Fly by Nightclub. She was up here three times. First time, she was up here for a week, and it was just, and it was gangbusters. So a year later, we brought her up again. And the weekend after she played here in Spinard for a week, she won a Grammy, her first Grammy. Okay, we brought her up a third time, and she played here for a week. She went home, and the next weekend, she was on Saturday Night Live and never played a club that or a place that seated less than 5,000 people in the rest of her career. So Queen Ida was just totally amazing. So I was talking to Queen Ida one of the times she was up here, and we're talking about performing, and she said, you got to grab them in the first song. If you don't, you won't get them back. And she further went on to say, you've got three songs to get them in your pocket. And if you do that, you'll have them, you know, for the whole night. If you fail to do that, you've lost them, and you won't get them back. Okay. So you start with the first song, it's got to hit them with everything you've got. Well, how many times has your band or any band you've seen gone on stage and started with some sleepy little instrumental where everybody takes a five-minute solo and everybody's saying, well, we're going to warm up and we're going get, to you know, get our act together here and then we'll really start the show. You've lost them already. You've got to hit them with the first song, give them everything you got. Okay, so what else separates the way the big-time guys operate and the way that some local bands operate? Well, first of all, oh, all right, we'll go back here uh, to that one. Okay, so, all right, you give them everything you got, but never, never, ever start a set with a slow song or end a set with a slow song. I mean, you want to hit these guys, you want to give them a reason to stay from the first song, and when you hit that last song of the set, you got to give them a reason not to go home during the break and wait around for the next one. And how many times, I, I go to open mics, the open mic model is always somebody starting with some sleepy slow song, and you got to grab them at the beginning, you got to give them a reason to like you. So it's just basic show business, but the big guys know that, and a lot of people on a local level, you know, don't know that. Okay, so you, um, what's next here? The, uh, all right. Okay, so you've got, okay. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen Taylor Swift in a concert finish a song, walk over to an amp, grab a beer, walk over to the guitar player and say, oh, what do you want to do next? You know, should we do a slow song or should we do a fast song? You know, and, and do you want to start it with a guitar or maybe we should start with a drum roll? I mean, you know, it, 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 never. They will never do that. And the reason for that is that dead air is your enemy. In any part of the performing industry, whether you're on the radio, whether you're on d d TV, whether, whether you're live on stage, dead air is the enemy. You just don't do it. Okay? How about this? All right. Have you ever gone to a Rolling Stones concert and see Keith Richards stop everything after a song and go to his amp and start fiddling with the knobs and flash his butt to the audience while he fiddles with his settings? I mean, these are basic tricks of the trade that all the big-time guys know. And we'll cover a million more of these in the Zoom presentation that we do coming up in March, and uh, Marion will be uh, announcing the date of that. I don't, I don't, has the date even been set? No. 
Oh, I have to tell you. Okay, all right. So yeah, but so we will we will do this, and we'll go into a lot more detail. But the the idea is you're creating an illusion for the audience. I mean, it's show business. You're creating illusion for the audience. Uh, one of the greatest musicians I've ever played with was a, was a jazz bass player named uh, Billy Peterson, and he was up here several times, and he'd play with us. And you'd finish the night, and Billy Peterson would say, we fooled him again. <laughs> right? And that's it. I mean, no matter what kind of music you do, you know, the show business principles and techniques are the same. And they're designed to enhance your show, to make your band seem bigger than life, and to get you a bigger audience, okay? And so we'll leave with one more quote from George Burns. I mean, George, the old comedian, he knew show business. And he said, in show business, the key word is honesty. Once you've learned to fake that, the rest is easy. <laughs> So, I want to thank you all for coming here. I want to thank Marion and Ingville for putting this on. I mean, incredible. I want to thank you all, and we'll bring up our next presenter. I keep talking about how we don't have good mechanisms for passing down institutional memory in music, and uh, and I just got a, I got a whole dose of institutional memory right there, and I'm also visualizing sequin salmon outfits. So, um, I uh, can I get uh, the Act Two slides on there too because I was going to announce this after, but he spoiled my surprise. Um, one of the things we are doing this year, we thought of a thing we could do that might work. And that is a monthly Zoom training um, by donation, uh, donations going to the instructors. Once a month, we are going to pull together a, hey, what if we just sat down and learned this from somebody who knows? So in February, we are looking at, let's see, where is my, am I at the end? At the beginning. John's fiddling, sorry. Whoop, 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 whoop. There we go. Yay. So here's our office hours we're having tomorrow. We're going to continue office hours online all year starting next month. Um, in February, we're gonna talk about how do you promote music to radio now, particularly college and local public affiliates because that's who still plays local music. Um, but we can't send them a stack of CDs anymore, so what do we do? Um, so we're gonna talk to some folks in Alaskan radio who care about Alaskan radio about that. Um, Mr. White Keys is gonna give us the longer version of what he knows about filling a house for 35 years and I'm keeping it exciting every time. Um, and in April, um, some of you who are wonks like me wanna actually get into the numbers for real, I would love to do that. Um, and uh, I would love to have some help too from people who are better at math than me. So we're gonna try and get some guests on to help do a long explainer about that. It'll be on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night on Zoom and we'll record them for your edification. All you need to do to know when these are happening is just be on our email list. And most of you are because you have registered. Um, so unless you said don't put me on your email list, you're gonna find out about these pretty soon, including the dates. That is the end of that announcement. Um, next up, I'm very, 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 very excited. Um, to bring up, um, why don't we get rid of this podium? You think you could help me get rid of this podium? I think we're done with it. Yeah, we're gonna go to conversation. We're gonna go couch style now. Is that no. No, first, it, what, is it you? It's no, it's not you. It's me. <laughs> can you help me move the podium? Oh, yeah, you can. Sorry, Chaz, will you help me take it? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Call a bass player when you need something moved. Um, <laughs> I would like to invite Mercedes and Kendra Arseniega to come up and join me to talk about Arseniega Street Productions for a few minutes. If you don't know about this yet, you are going to. I'm very excited. Please give them a big welcome. Oh, yes. Now we get to the chill part. Oh. Check, check. You're not following yeah. Mr. White Keys, you're encoring <laughs> Mr. White Keys. That's not good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You guys put on you guys put on some pretty dramatic, cinematic, <laughs> exciting stuff too. Tell me about your programming. Thank you so much. So we've been in operation for about two years, so we're we're kind of a baby 
boutique production company. Um, and we don't like to put ourselves in a box. Um, it's literally just me and Mercedes. That's it. And a team of very talented people um, who we've gotten to know over the years. Um, I come from a TV and film industry background. She comes from a music background. And we have a lot of crazy ideas, <laughs> irrational <laughs> ideas of like, wouldn't this be cool if we did this? And don't like to be limited by a lack of resources. Um, and so we actually got our start producing drag shows. That is what we are known for. Um, but we've also branched out to music um, production just because we both come from families of musicians. We're both performers and artists ourselves. Um, and so we produce a lot of drag shows and a lot of um, co like concert series around town that feature uh, the vast array of local talent that we have and just like creating more opportunities um, for local artists and specifically marginalized artists. So our wheelhouse and our focus is prioritizing LGBTQ and BIPOC artists in town, whether that's drag performers, uh, burlesque artists, uh, and also musicians. So I'll let you cover anything I missed. Yeah, I think that's our, our big focus is is making sure that those opportunities and genres are represented um, and also uh, the types of audience members that we bring in. Um, and that also has a lot to do with the space activation that you use. Um, I think we can all probably agree to some extent that um, what brings in people for events, part of that's venue, part of that is you as the, the artist, part of that is the producer slash and or promoter if they're two different things. And so everybody brings an element there to it. And so I think that's something that we also try to be mindful of when we're doing our events as well. Uh, what are some of the venues where you've done activations as you call them? Um, yeah, another like not secret is like the venue shortage that we have and like a lot of people are wringing their hands of like there's nowhere for us to perform no tea no shade like everyone's like well we have like uh you know we have like Willowa, we have 49th state we have all these things but you know when you're limited to so many options even if those options are really wonderful um it starts to feel a little claustrophobic and so we have sort of specialized in space activation and that is a big reason why we've been successful for just being a baby company because we focus on small and medium-sized events um, because we basically create our own venues <laughs> out of partnerships. So what I mean by space activation is we, through building meaningful relationships with local business owners, we figure out ways to activate spaces that are already existing, therefore creating new venues. So we have two shows, Drag Loteria, which is like a Mexican bingo and drag show. It's all ages. It's amazing. It's very fun. Uh, that happens monthly at Cafecito Bonito in East Anchorage. Shout out to Cafecito. Yeah. We love them. Yeah. <laughs> and we also do uh, alt R&B Neo Soul Plus concert series at Cafecito Bonito called Lights Down Low. And that features a new local artist, a different local artist every month. That is also at Cafecito. And if you've been, anybody been to Cafecito Bonito? Some of the best nice, coffee in town. Right, yeah. And that is, um, we're, we're a Latina-owned, woman-owned, queer-owned business. That is also a Latina-owned, queer-owned, woman-owned business. And so we really bonded over that, of just like shared experiences through our identity. That's a relationship we've been cultivating for years at this point. And so when you build like meaningful, real relationships with people, then you can sort of tr kind of transgress into that collaborative aspect of your relationship and through that relationship you can kind of get cooking with creative ideas and uh, cafecito is kind of like an awkwardly shaped cafe it's literally just like coffee bar and a long strip it's a little bit of a tech nightmare yeah. if you're trying to cram a band anybody remember the old rum runners that used to be <laughs> next to the historic hotel and it was just like that little tiny stage it's like smaller than that so yeah, yeah. and you know, you have to get creative with your solutions because don't let the space and the literal configuration of the space confine you. So for Drag Loteria, we decided to make it a big runway for the drag performers. It works great. Um, for Lights Down Low, um, that small concert series, I mean, that space fits like 50 people in there. That's it. And But it sells out every time. We've never not had a sold out show in the two years we've been in operation. And yeah. thank you. <laughs> Um, Just like Mr. Wakey's, there we go. Exactly. So, yeah. 
<laughs> but we know our niche, which is um, those smaller venues, those more intimate shows, intimate productions, because the small shows do facilitate the bigger shows. They kind of bring people in for like a moment of intimacy with the artists rather than just being like a face in the crowd. You actually get to sit down and like get to know the artists that you're, you're um, you know, you paid to come and see and it, you, it feels more personal. And so when you do end up seeing that artist on a larger stage, like you kind of feel like you know them. And so that works. Um, so don't discount the small gigs at coffee shops. And I know there's a jazz jam that happens at Fire Island as well. Hugely successful. There is some incredible music that's being made there and they are activating space. Um, and all ages space ones? too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was gonna say um, to kind of add to that, and also to um, touch on what Mr. Whitekeys was talking about is just like the fact of when you have those small and medium venues, um, it is about the community connection, right? As performers, we understand that we give to them and then they give to us and it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship. And there's a way to invite them in while still being elevated and polished and and, and bringing the ooh la la that we we're kind of talking about, right? The, the experience. So that's also something that's really important to, to capitalize on. And that also, when you have those venues, um, you never know know when they will hit it big and you will never see them in that venue again you will never see them that close you will never see them for that for free or that cheap so those have a place for us right beyond like the stadiums or even the larger halls that are 100 plus the the 10 to 50 range is still a sweet spot for that intimacy uh, I have one more question, yeah, and that is when, I really loved when we talked, you brought up that you expect professionalism from the folks you work with, even if they're not necessarily used to like signing a contract and going through the whole process, that you treat everyone like they're seasoned professional and you, in some ways that's an opportunity for you to kind of level them up into like, we're doing this with a contract, we're doing this with all the details nailed down and so on. Okay, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time we'll work with, um, especially just like in the prioritization of marginalized artists, and a, a large part of that is because we were um, trying to fill the gap and we were frustrated that there just didn't seem to be like as many opportunities for um, artists of color, queer artists. There weren't as many, like, it didn't feel like there was a, like a niche for people like us, and so, um, knowing that, that there aren't as many opportunities. And then there are a lot of new artists who just don't have experience and they can't get into some of the larger venues. So like working with us, like we try to create a experience where like they know what to expect. And like everybody has to get their start somewhere. <laughs> and you don't want to count people out just because they don't have experience. And so it's kind of like incumbent on the producers to, to set that tone and set that standard so that it also sets up the artist for success too so that they know like what the standard is when they move into other relationships and other gig opportunities. Yeah, and I think um, uh, I personally in life and in work, I value so much in clear communication. Yeah. Communication, communication, communication. And I think again, I feel safe because I'm a musician. That's not always a strong suit with every musician. <laughs> um, and sometimes you have that breakdown, but you, it, it is a collaboration, right? No one is the enemy, the venue isn't the enemy, the musician isn't the enemy. So being as, as forthright, um, and as, as detailed as possible. I think anyone who's worked with us, they might think like, oh, Kendra and Mercedes, like details, 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 but it saves you from having all the hiccups later on, or oh my gosh, we are five minutes before doors are opening and we do not have this equipment or whatever that is. So we really try to make sure we're being really clear. You have any questions, keep the door open, you know, really keeping those lines open as well, um, everything in writing everything in writing. Even if you're not having an, like, an official contract, have something so that you all both can reference it. Have a paper trail. Like I think at a bare minimum, even if you don't have your ducks in a row and you're still trying to get things started out, at least keep track of your emails and your text conversations and everything because that at least gives you some something to reference on at a minimum. Um, I want to have you for another hour, but um, <laughs> let me um, just ask you if there's any final thing that you want to share and give space for that. Sure. Um, we talked a lot about space activation, and we could literally have a whole, our own summit on space activation. Um, <laughs> because I know everyone wrings their hands about the lack of venues in town, I really, really implore people to like, I know people are already doing it, but like explore those relationships, explore creative ideas, transform existing spaces around town. Like we have 
produced a whole like underground drag show in a literal dance studio where dancers rehearse and we in turn the middle it, of industrial area of yeah and, like an off arctic in a very awkward industrial space but like it sells out every time it's a very cool experience it's happening this weekend um <laughs> we're literally going there after this but it's Transforming spaces, think outside the box, think, cre think creatively. There are venues all over town. We just haven't activated them yet. So yeah. make, create your own opportunities. We definitely like are a testament to like, don't wait for your ship to come in. Just build your own boat and sail. Yeah. Like, just do it. it like, yeah, just to finish that off of, uh, if you have those crazy ideas, go with it. Find the people who want to support it and make it real. It's only crazy because nobody has, has, has done it yet, right? So if Alaska is a trailblazing state. This is what we're known for. So um, don't be afraid to do the same in your own area, and you will attract those people, and you will collaborate, and you will create beautiful things. Do it for the culture. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Arseniega Street Productions, Kendra and Mercedes. <laughs> Doing great. Thank you. Dropping everything. I'm gonna pass the mic directly to Ingle. Yeah, let's go. Thank you so much. Give it up again. Thank you. Okay, I get to talk again a little bit, but mainly listen. I want to welcome uh, another Alaskan visitor from the straight from the salmon capital of the world, Ketchikan, Chaz Gist. Welcome. So I. Oh, hello. Is it one two one two. Yes. Can okay. you hear me now? Perfect. So, um, the cool thing about doing this is that we get to meet people. But at the summit, I've never met you before. Yeah. We have never met. We've had some email dialogue. Absolutely. And we sent some music in for the Alaska fake book or Alaska real book. Absolutely. They did a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. And Karen, who left, Karen Rockus, helped us fly you up here. We're super mm -hmm. happy that you... Thank you very much. From K-E-U-L. -K She's not in the room right now, but thank you, Karen, for donating miles. And you live kind of, yeah, far away from here, but very close to Canada. Does it feel more Canadian than Alaskan? No, definitely not. Definitely not. No. Good. That's the, the right. The health care is really the main yeah. thing. You can really feel it. <laughs> there is that. Okay, so, uh, it, but just, okay, tell me what's going on in Ketchikan. What works? What is it that yeah. you're working on? So, uh, I've been a full-time bass player in Ketchikan for the, since 2017, and it's been going pretty good. We, uh, I mean, it's bass most of the time, but like uh, Marion earlier was talking about with uh, the survey that went out, and she's hearing how many things, how many shoes people are filling in their community. And I like, I've been liking the term arts worker that kind of uh, builds a little more kind of solidarity compared to kind of a lot of the language kind of makes you feel like an island, right? And where most people in the arts are doing a whole bunch of things. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm playing bass most of the time, but I've been doing a couple guitar gigs a week these days. And then I uh, help out in the theater. I volunteer in the schools, right? And there's all these things that come together and... Uh, you know, to make it work. Right. And then um, one of the main things that you're kind of famous for now, just to jump right in, well, is the board boardwalks work that you do? Or, oh, well, we uh, so we have a new uh, burlesque operation, the Red Lantern, So, uh, which will be like a historic kind of uh, burlesque act, but a, also a kind of historic tour of sex work in Ketchikan, which has all this great sex work, sex work history from Creek Street and stuff. And so it's a live band burlesque show. Uh, we'll have like three or four acts a day. And uh, so that'll be like a day gig next summer, probably. But uh, in, normally in the summer, there's a whole lot of economic activity. And so I get you know, three or four gigs a day most days. And so it's just bopping from thing to thing to thing. And we, we talked about this earlier. Uh, the people in this town are musicians in this town, often play... 16 different styles of music. You rehearse your symphony orchestra at 4 p.m. and then you go and become the Ramones and at 8 p.m. or midnight. Is it the same way in Ketchikan? Do people um, do a lot of different things? Yeah. I mean, uh, Alaska is very folky on the whole, but Ketchikan really has no folk music whatsoever. It's just funk and dance bands for the most part. We have a little, we have a little fledgling like chamber group as well. And uh, sometimes I play jazz during the day in the summer. But uh, you really got to kind of be able to do whatever. But as a bass player, it's kind of easy to have a... Everything needs a bass, but 
a lot of, most people don't want to play bass. And also, I'm not just stuck in Ketchikan. I go through, usually throughout Southeast, so Ketchikan, Juneau, Petersburg, Sitka, sometimes Prince of Wales, and then also Pacific Northwest. Mm-hmm. So I go to Seattle a few times so, a year. Okay, so you tour quite a lot with... The, can you talk a little bit about that, touring from Ketchikan? A little bit more than what you just yeah. said. Talk so I've uh, more recently... Well, I've been Ray Troll and the Ratfish Wranglers. I've been their bass player for about 10 years. And then uh, Dude Mountain most recently... Um, has been touring through Southeast and probably will be going to uh, up here more often. We just came to Anchorage for the first time uh, this last summer to play in Talkeetna, right? But through most of the summer, we had a, a travel gig every two weeks. So it's been very busy, and it'll probably start up again in the spring. And So it's been very exciting. So when you play in uh, Dude Mountain, for example, how right. often can you play a gig and fill a house or have your good audiences in uh, dude mountain specifically Ketchikan. in yeah. town we do once or twice a month but uh, most of my regular work is just playing in restaurants and like uh, um they were saying about uh not community space activation mm-hmm. space activation right so over the last uh 10 years or so we've been able to kind of increase musician pay by quite a bit um Ketchikan was uh, is a community that had kind of stagnated for a little while after our main industries shut down in the 90s. and But by starting to play in restaurants and then building the expectation that there's music in restaurants when you go out and uh, increasing that market and increasing that expectation when people go out, we've been able to kind of control the rates. And uh, like, what was the, the gal from Memphis? was talking about $250. Was your, that's what we're usually looking at um, for musicians pay in a given night and so it's been pretty good up from you know the normal like hundred dollar rate or or just people playing for drink chips or whatever else right so we've been able to over time by you know, one collaborating with whoever else is a performer in town and uh making friends with the bartenders so they they know how much money is coming in on a given night and being able to leverage that kind of information when you're talking to a club owner or a bar or a restaurant whatever and uh, it's been really helpful for kind of uh, making the industry in Ketchikan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. And I'm glad you started to uh, take inspiration from some of the uh, things that we've talked about here. I actually wanted to ask you specifically about another thing, uh, which is the music ambassadorship. Uh, from what you've heard here today about that, and maybe what you know or have you know thought about earlier, what how would something like that work for you? Do you think that would work with you and your band? Uh, uh, talking to your Ketchikan tourist agency or Muni or uh, being sponsored, how 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 would that play out for you? Do you think? I like the idea. I think Ketchikan's strange government system would maybe get in the way, but if uh, we got through like through the Arts Council, right? If the Arts Council's got some funding for it and we were able to organize through them, that would probably help, right? So if it was uh, not so much a city based but state-based funding, then I think that would work. Okay. Laura, hi. Hi. <laughs> now we'll talk more to Arts Council and others. Uh, sure. and in terms of, we don't have to talk directly about money, but there's also support. Um, uh, can you say something about uh, the kind of audience support and community support you generally feel as a musician in Ketchikan? Well, Ketchikan is very supportive of the arts. Um, there's a very large visual arts and photography community down there, but... Uh, in general, performing arts are pretty well supported. And it's not like, um, you know, your regional music cities, which often get really saturated and have any given musician might have a hard time convincing somebody to pay them anything, right? Because, well, if you don't do it, some other guy off the street will come do it and they'll be happy to do it, right? So it can be hard to advocate for yourself in a place like Seattle where it's, there's just so much, right? And so being in a more isolated place and being able to uh, where, where it still f- kind of feels special to have live music somewhere and have that also kind of neighborly connection with whoever's performing because it's a small town and everybody kind of knows each other, right? And then on top of that, all the, the seasonal workers who come in and out and the cruise musicians who come in and out. So a lot of times we're playing with the cruise musicians during the day. We have a jazz club downtown. And so you have uh, eight cruise ships in town and each cruise ship has a couple of bands Right, and we'll just be managing a jam session with all the different uh, cruise ship bands. Right, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of energy coming through artistically. 
Oh, great. Well, that, you answered my next question, how the cruise ships are affecting the music life in Ketchikan, if at all. Well, there's a lot of practical good things as far as all the seasonal workers that come in to support that um, have a lot of economic energy, right? And they're going out and spending all their money every night, and they're young and have a lot of energy. They stay out late. The cruise ships themselves, I would really like a cap. I would like a... Juno's been talking about it, but it's really environmentally and just practically on our infrastructure has been kind of difficult as we go, and it just keeps growing exponentially, and it's really frustrating. So there's right. good parts, bad parts. Right. Is there anything else that I should have asked you that uh, um, you well, want to uh, share? We have a new uh, a jazz workshop in Sitka, the Sitka Jazz Week. And this last year, we had Bernard Purdy, the most recorded drummer in history, was the main guest at this uh, jazz workshop. And I got to go with the Gateway Trio, is our trio in Ketchikan. And then we had uh, some other musicians from New York area, some in the Sitka area, and we just kind of, uh, as three separate jazz trios, different rhythm trios, essentially, um, working with a crew of students, and they're going between venues and performing things at the venues with us and having classes with uh, Bernard and the, the rest of the teachers there. And that's very exciting. That's in uh, Sitka in August. You can look that up, sitkajazzweek.com or something like that. Yep, that's something like that, dot <laughs> yeah. com. Okay, well, thank you. Are you going to stick around tomorrow for the... Uh, yeah, I'm the sticking tables? around tomorrow. I think I'm hosting a table. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. I was hoping you would say that. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Chaz, for talking to us, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank you very much. All right, we got one more set of interviews, I think. Um, we're going to be talking about music media with Lauren and Cody here, but as they make their way up here. Are we all having a good time? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Wanted to make sure we still had energy, you know? Um, oh my gosh, I've been learning so much and having so much fun in absorbing all this information. I mean, Mr. White Keys, you don't know me, but I know you. <laughs> and like, your presentation was amazing. And wow, I mean, you say we can play circles around you. I don't know if that's true, but you can sure talk circles around us. So that was super fun. Thank you for being here. Okay, hi, Cody. Hi, Lauren. Hi. So we are here to talk about music media. And um, instead of me introducing you, I'm going to just let you guys introduce yourselves. Can you tell, about, tell us about who you are and your program? All right, I guess I'm going first. Uh, so sitting right next to me is Lauren Langford. Uh, <laughs> She runs the Alaska music scene, as well as uh, does some photography and is a math teacher, as well. No, no, not, not math. <laughs> We're doing great. This is amazing. <laughs> Let's make a up teacher. job titles for each other. That's more fun. History teacher. <laughs> and to my right is Cody. He runs AK Concerts, um, which includes a constant run of events here in Anchorage and around the state. And I can tell you right now that Alaska Music Zine would not exist without AK Concerts. Really, uh, I, I plan my, my uh, schedule around what you have on your website. So <laughs> very, very good resource. Media collaborating with each other, we love it. Okay. So um, let's start with you, Lauren. You recently started Alaska Music Zine. Um, zine, sorry. <laughs> um, can you tell us what inspired your journey? So I was a freelance photojournalist for the Anchorage Press, and I was contributing weekly to the ICYMI. And then suddenly and without warning, Anchorage Press closed in November of 2022. And by that time, I had already sunk a large portion of mine and my wife's income to low-light photography equipment, which is expensive. And I was like, well, crap. <laughs> and sat around for a few months and listened to people saying things like, man, we need something like Anchorage Press. And I'd say, yeah, we really do need something like Anchorage Press. And then I was sitting in my classroom one morning during my, my planning period, and I was like, oh, what the heck? And so I launched Alaska Music Zine as a, yeah, as a, uh, a Facebook and Instagram platform f first with plans to expand into print medium later on. 
Amazing. Okay, Cody, can you tell us a little bit about your journey and how long you've been doing it? Yeah, I uh, I started AK Concert in March of 2018, um, but it began a little bit before that. It's kind of a first. It began on an Excel spreadsheet, a calendar for myself. Okay, I was juggling three or four jobs, and I wanted to go to concerts, and I kept missing out on all the fun stuff. So I would plot when I was going to be at work, when I was going to be at my other work, when I was going to be at school, when I was going to try and squeak a date in, and when I was going to go to concerts. And my friend kept saying, hey, what's going on this week? What's going on this week? And traveling a bunch, uh, when I go to other music cities, I'll see they have calendars, Monday, all the music, Tuesday, every day. We didn't really have that, and so I just started building a website, uh, kind of as a little passion project, and then in March, I got fired from Willowa, and I said, you know what, screw it, I'm going to go launch my website, and I uh, have been doing it ever since. If you guys haven't checked out AK Concerts, it literally is like a one of the only, if not the only, comprehensive list of all events going on statewide. So if, yes. <laughs> so if you have friends in town or you have a free weekend, like that is a really great place to go um, to see what is happening in our community. And it's a big endeavor and it must take so much time. Do you do it all yourself? Do you have a team with you? I know when we were emailing, you said um, one of the positives was that it gives you a lot of volunteer hours. And I was like, is he doing this all volunteer? Oh my gosh. So tell me more. I am by myself for it. Um, luckily, there's uh, people out there like Chad Carter or um, the, the gals from Arsenga well, who will invite me to events that are coming up. So I at least get some notifications coming in of shows. But a lot of it is, yeah, I, I do it all. And um, I would like to bring people on, but I, I don't really make a whole lot of money doing it. And I can't ask someone else to, hey, come do a bunch of work. And uh, so I, I, I do it myself. Well, it's amazing work that you're doing and the community is clearly benefiting from it so thank you for all that you do um, yes. <laughs> and Lauren like can you tell me about what it was like creating your own opportunities and what like what you have learned in that process how it has fed your passion your soul and all of that so Alaska music zine um, it's a combination of photography and um, like written band reviews and, and just uh, pumping up local music musicians. And it was cool to create this space, at least first for myself, because it was a way to continue uh, my work as a photographer and also a way to kind of tap back into my background as a writer in a way that felt um, safe and that is just 100% giving back to the community. Um, what I learned pretty quickly is that the need for what I'm doing is way, way bigger than what I have time to give and contribute to. Um, I would love for this to be my full-time job, but just like Cody, I'm, I'm not getting paid. And it is, I wouldn't feel comfortable inviting someone in to do what's essentially my passion project and be like, hey, this will be like a 50 hour a week job and you won't get paid. Aren't you super excited about that? <laughs> um, but the flip side of it is that, um, you know, I, I've been involved in a lot of things for, for years. I coach competitive sports and I'm a teacher. And prior to that, I worked for Kaladi Brothers and for Y of Alaska. And so I've had big roles in lots, of lo in lots and lots of places, but I can honestly say that I've never felt a sense of community until I got involved in the music community in the capacity that I'm in now. And so while I end up feeling guilty a lot of the time because people are like, hey, come to my show. And I'm like, great, I'll be there. And then, you know, that was like 7 a.m. me who was full of hope and life. 
and hadn't spent the day with 150 teenagers yet. And then 3 p.m. me is like, I'm never leaving my house again. <laughs> but um, it's, there's a lot of joy in this and a lot of fun and it's fed my soul for sure, grown my art for sure. I was actually, when I was contributing photos to this event, I was like, man, my photography's gotten a lot better. I can't believe anybody let me take pictures of them at first, I'm bad. Um, so it's grown my art and um, grown the community, and I have lots and lots of ideas. Um, but I, the music zine needs help. I can't pay you, but a mu the music zine needs help. <laughs> so. How how can our community support you in in other ways? Because like in in many ways, support is free, right? We can comment on each other's posts, we can share them, um, and how how can the community support you? So I'm on Facebook and Instagram under Alaska Music Zine. Everybody should be pulling their phones out right now. <laughs> and you're going to go like and follow on Facebook, and then you're going to follow on Instagram. And when you see new posts of bands that you know, and especially bands that you don't know, you are going to share those posts and tell everybody about opportunities to see those musicians because um, local music really is grassroots, it's word of mouth, it's about you telling that person that you maybe know, don't know very well, like, hey, there's this really cool musician that's doing this really cool thing, and all of a sudden, B Black Barrel and the Bad Men here locally is a really good example. They were playing to, like, nobody, and all of a sudden now everybody's like, well, Black Barrel and the Bad Men, I coached them when they were very small. <laughs> and it was an effort of just saying like, hey, these guys are doing some really dope work. You need to go check them out. And now everybody is coming to me and being like, do you know Black Bear on the Bad Men? I'm like, yeah, aren't they great? It's, you know, and that's, that's how we support each other. I, uh, I first heard about them from you gushing about them. And I saw them a couple weeks ago. And I love them. Yeah. So thank you for that. And uh, if, you, if I can support you, I have a section in my newsletter that needs photos and a writer. Okay, I hate that. Look at this, Aww, look you at guys. That. This is this happening Aww. right here. <laughs> How can we support you, Cody, as a community? Um, that's a good question. Uh, like Lauren said, sharing and tagging and sharing. Uh, I don't know if it made the slideshow, but I can show everyone how to get the AK con on your phone very, uh, very easily. Um, uh, maybe, it, maybe it made it in, maybe it not, but. <laughs> Hello. Only for iPhone users. Uh, if you go to akconcerts.com and now, yeah, we don't have it, so I'm gonna have to just walk through it. Um, if you go to any website that works for anything on your phone, at the bottom of the page, you have the little share icon. When you tap on that icon and scroll down, and there's a section, add to home screen. You click on that, you hit add, and you will have a shortcut on your phone. So with the touch of one button, it'll take you right to that website. And let me train Mike. <laughs> AK Concerts updates daily. Uh, I have the list for any, every, uh, every day throughout the state. Um, it's not an all-inclusive list. I do miss a lot of shows, and I'm sorry if I've ever missed one of your, uh, one of your gigs. But sharing and spreading the word is the best way to help. I just realized too, in general, like you talk about concerts that are about to happen, and a lot of the times you report on things that have happened. So we have like the whole pipeline right here. Haha, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but in that pipeline, like, do you see obstacles? I know in, in some of our emails we were talking about, you know, how a lack of promotion and a lack of the planning for that promotion can really hinder what you're doing. Um, so can you tell us some of like the obstacles that you might see that we as a community can do better? Because I think when we all talk about them, it, everyone benefits. 
Uh, I'm actually going to steal a quote here from Lauren Dixon. He said it earlier, and I was like, oh, gosh, that's really good. Um, repetition, 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 okay? You need to promote yourself to the point that the people that have known you forever don't want to be your Facebook friends anymore, okay? <laughs> As a musician, if you are not excited about yourself, if you are not investing in your public image, why on earth would anyone else get excited about you? Come on. Um, that means, you know, investing money in good, good photos, investing money in good uh, visual media with um, videos. It means your, your public persona on your website. It means your social media. You've got to invest time in that. And then this is me saying to me as well, you have to leave your house. You have to put on pants. You have to leave your house. You have to go talk to people. You've got to get out there. I, I think that the biggest thing that I see talking to artists in my work is that they are not nearly as excited about their music as I am. And you've got to promote yourself. You've got to promote yourself. There's very few people that will promote your work for you if you're not promoting it yourself. And yeah, social media, I think, is a very big tool. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. It seems to be very big. But <laughs> just uh, for me, I know Instagram stories and Facebook stories, every time you share that, when everyone else opens up their phone, your name is up there right at the top of the list for, um, oh, hey, a new reel, a new story, and being staying current and relevant and on people's top of mind. Absolutely. Yeah, and just to, like, pitch in with that, like, as a community, like, what it, I feel like we always underestimate the power of asking for help. Like, if you put out on social media, like, hey, I would appreciate it if you, my followers, would share my post or recommend that other people follow me. Like, we will do that for each other. So, you know, being able to do that and having the confidence to do that is another thing, too. But another opportunity to plug office hours, which I will talk about in a second. Um, but before we wrap it up, is there anything else that you want to share with everybody here? Um, I'm just grateful to be here. Uh, I went to the first... Akimi, well, my first Akimi Summit a few years ago, and we was just blown away by everyone coming together. Uh, I've been furiously scribbling and taking notes at everything, and I'm really looking forward to all the slide decks afterwards. And uh, yeah, excited for what music 2024 has. For my part in this, I'm actually gonna ask everybody to participate a little bit here. I've got a camera on stage with me. I'm gonna stand up and what I want everyone to do is like hands up and on the count of three, we're gonna say Akimi. Does that sound like something everybody can do? Yeah? Like we're excited about it, guys. Okay, everybody up. On your feet. On the count of three. Hands up. <laughs> Thank Please you, everybody. Give it up for Lauren and Cody. Thank you so much. And I said I would plug office hours just for a second before we move on to sharing the, the post. Yes, absolutely. Um, for those of you who are interested in coming tomorrow and are curious of what like topics that are going to be talked about um, on the event schedule page at the alaskamusicsummit.com, if you scroll down, there are a bunch of bios that you will see of all the office hours hosts and their like topic of expertise. So if you're looking for someone to talk to in terms of like social media or branding or TV and film, like all those topics are listed under people's bios, so go check that out. Okay, I'm done. We got Lucy Peckham, y'all. Show up for Lucy Peckham lessons. <laughs> no. <laughs> we got a ton of local heroes. It's really exciting. We This is a new idea, but we hope it will develop. Um, I'm going to throw real quick to what you guys said. Actually, Lisa, will you help me with just a couple of these? We can just read some off real quick. Yeah. Like, the solutions that you guys... You already have a microphone. Yeah. Have to. Um <laughs> Double fisting um, microphone. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to see some of the some of the stuff you guys wrote. We have the most amazing volunteer crew. Can I please hear it for an incredible, organized, kick-ass volunteer crew? So proud, so relieved. Woo. 
one of these volunteers, <laughs> um, Heather, uh, aka String of Lights, Heather Stewart, um, came back and uh, helped us type these up and even like categorized and color tagged them. And uh, God, I love a musician who knows her way around a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> it's just the sexiest thing. But let's just read some of these real quick. We can't read all of them, but let's just go for it. There's more. Oh. Um, venues, house concerts, teen clubs, diverse spaces. Hell yes. Oh, I'm going yeah, next. Just pick oh, one. Great. We'll, yeah, just uh, A we'll musician postcard and mailable CDs with holiday songs. Ooh. Okay. AK Concerts, I see a plug for that. Wearing the colorful jackets from Homer on all of our touring performance. I like that. Yes, costumes. Not enough costumes. <laughs> Uh, bar gigs, making coasters with Linktree, Spotify, and Venmo codes. Ooh, virtual tips. Great mm -hmm. idea. What's PA invest? Oh, investing in your PA. Is that mm. right? Okay. Excellent. Yes. I have like five of them now. If anyone in Juno wants one, I don't know where they keep coming from. Um, who has the clicker? Um, John, I could do. you click us? <laughs> okay. This is community of practice. I love this. Um, going to live shows and meeting local musicians to build relationships that could in time turn into a unique artistic project. Has anyone ever collabed with a band you never thought you would collab with or a classical artist or a teacher or a, yeah, I've seen some amazing stuff happen here. Um, I love this one. Mentor by lifting each other, we rise. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like the range of concrete to abstract, tagging others and mentioning them on your own Instagram stories, reciprocity, shouting out other people. Sometimes I like them they introduce themselves or introduced each other. It is easier mm -hmm. than doing your own bio. Each other. Or I meant themselves, but yeah. they do it was I've, better. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is funny and also really true. Reaching out to other community arts councils because Anchorage doesn't have one. Right. Did you know there's this magical thing called an arts council elsewhere and they'll help you play a show in another community? They're real nice. Um, most of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know any bad I don't know any bad ones. I just haven't, you know, I haven't yeah. played the circuit lately, so I'm out of practice. Let's hit one more. Um, performance anxiety, <laughs> close your eyes. <laughs> How does Mr. White Keys feel about that? <laughs> Some people look really good with their eyes closed. <laughs> <True>. You know. <laughs> if you're putting on a show, dress like it. I like that. Yeah. Uh, oh, I also like this. Relax and remember the audience wants you to win. That mm -hmm. can be hard to remember, but true. Mm -hmm. Building consistent, healthy behaviors when on tour. Why would you, why would you at me like that? Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, write a contract with yourself, guaranteeing yourself the same kind of treatment you would give a musician friend. I love that. Also, write contracts for each other. Yeah, no kidding. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Co write contracts in general. That's great. <laughs> So we got um, dozens and dozens and dozens more of these, and we are going to be sharing this um, and most of our content from today, the, the slides, the links, even links that are just mentioned in passing by our guests. We take the time to actually collate all of those and put them in our wrap-up. So look for it. There'll be the video from today that Frostline is doing. It's really pretty. Um, like, multi-camera shoots make you look like you know what you're doing when you're holding two microphones in one hand. <laughs> and... Uh, and we also do want as many people as possible to access those resources. So even people who weren't here will get this lengthy list of, oh, hey, here's this grant, here's this service, hey, here's AK Concerts, here's how you do X, Y, Z. So please remember, those resources are there for you. They are free. They're what we live to build. And um, you'll be getting them in your email, but they'll also live on our website for you to share with other people. We're a small scene. We don't have to compete. We can share this info around because when we do, when we all do better, we all do better. We've seen that happen here in the past. Past, when one place, when a scene really happens and suddenly like, or one, one venue, one presenter, one artist really digs in and does stuff, the scene grows around them, right? And it starts just developing. We can do that for each other. We can help each other that way. Um, I'm going to throw to one more set of videos and then we're going to have our last panel of the day. I'm sorry we're running a little bit behind, but this is all such good stuff and we can't rush good stuff. This is, this is slow cooker crock pot wisdom here. Hi, I'm Rob Goldberg. I'm here in my shop near Haynes, Alaska, 
where I make guitars, violins, cellos, and mandolins. I love working with musicians to make the instrument that's just right for them so that they can make the music that they want to make. And music is great because music makes people happy. Your wish, it go like this. Um, pum, um, pum. Yo, what's up, everybody? This is your boy, Tater Tot. One word, Pants. capital T-A-T-E-R, um. capital T-O-T-T, no spaces. I'm a hip-hop artist that grew up mostly in Nome, Alaska. I also spent some of my childhood right here in Anchorage in the UMed district. I was a dad before I started rapping, which inspired my motto, Food for Thought Music. My real name is Edward Tate, and that's where Tater Tot comes from. And with my initials being E.T., well, I rap about being an alien a lot. It's a lot of fun. And uh, what's coming next is a shameless plug with my kids. Can't slow down, no. No, 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 no. Yo, I uh, gladly uh, promote that song because it's got all of my kids on it. But um, I hope y'all uh, have a lot of fun here at the summit if you're attending and if you're watching online. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Lauren S.H. Scannelberry. I'm here in my cozy home office in Anchorage. 2023 was really good to me. I got to perform in person for the first time since before the pandemic and remember how special that is. This was also a year that I redefined for myself what it means to be an artist. I'm still writing songs, recording albums, performing, but I'm also more interested in making music in community. I got to see music this year as a healing agent for um, by playing music with people experiencing homelessness. And I want to continue exploring music as not just product, but as process and community and connection. And I'm excited to do more of that in 2024. Hey man, this is Kurt Riemann at Surreal Studios in downtown Anchorage, Alaska. This is the control room and that's the studio. Lots of microphones, good stuff in there coming in and make a beautiful sound. What I want to talk to you about is the Alaska Music Podcast. If you've done any kind of music in Alaska, I want you to send it to me so we can put it on the podcast. It airs once a week and it's an hours worth of Alaska music. Also, the other reason I watch your music is we have the Alaska Music Archives, a nonprofit that is collecting music from the 40s up until this week. So if you're doing music, you want to send it to us so it gets in that archive. Send us a single, send us an album, or whatever's next. All right, take care. Stay warm with an Alaskan song in your heart. I love loving all the faces of all the people that I get to see on these videos, man. Um, I'm going to invite some artists up to join me. We're going to do one last chat, and it is just, uh, just artist to artist about how we have survived this so far and how we plan to survive the life of being an artist. Um, I am so happy that y'all were able to join me. Thank you. Um, I'd love for you to introduce yourselves for folks who don't know, Ashley and, and then Audrey and then... <laughs> Ashley Young. My name is Ashley Young. My singer-songwriter, based in Anchorage. Um, I I lived away for 13 years, and I've been I came back in 2021, and have been just aggressively involved. Did we get here? Check check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and just trying to uplift other artists. Just like kind of what we were talking about on some of these bullets, big time uh, proponent in when one of us is uplifted, all of us are. Mic check, hello. Hi, I'm Adriana Latonio. I have been performing as a singer, dancer, um, just overall artist for a majority of my life. Um, and I'm currently in Pipeline Vocal Project as the soprano. Mm -hmm. And Ivy. <laughs> I'm Ivy Silence, and I am Alaska's goth duo, yeah. Cliff and Ivy. Um, <laughs> We've played music together since the 80s, and specifically this project since 
2011, and uh, we are currently working on a new album. Last year we toured, we tour almost every year, but last year I think we did about 14 gigs, and 13 of them were out of state. One was in Fairbanks, so <laughs> glad to be here. Yeah. Go Fairbanks. Uh, um, I am going to ask kind of a different question, and this is um, about your, uh, if you have any thoughts about your relationship to um, uh, body health disciplines of wellness, mental health in your own life, your family life, um, how you think of that, and what it, what, what, how it relates to you as a musician. I just want to hear your general thoughts. Mm -hmm. You can go in any order, <laughs> just anything. Ivy, go ahead. And Body also. health, like how to take care of yourself physically and stuff? I think you can define it broadly. So when, when you say take care of yourself, I think we all think of the thing we're worst at doing maybe, so, but, um, <laughs> or the thing that we prioritize the most, I don't know. But. Uh, just, you know, for myself, um, I started a vegan diet a couple of years ago after being a vegetarian. That helped me. It doesn't mean any, you know, like it's not your thing at all. I just do what works for me. Try to stay as healthy as you can um, and try to keep it in balance. Give yourself time to rest and just realize that sometimes your, your creative process takes time. Um, with our family, it's interesting. Cliff and I do have two young adult sons who have autism and so we spend every moment with them. You know, they live at home with us. Uh, they are very inspiring to us and bring us that kind of different look at life. And through music, because of the genre that we do, we've been able to connect with a lot of people who are you know, in the community of neurodivergent thought. Um, and it's kind of a different approach. So we just went with it over the years, of course, because you have to, because that's the way, you know, if they're your kids, what are you gonna do, you know? Um, and just give space for something you didn't expect. And that's, that's one thing I think is, has been valuable. One method that I try and employ is accountability. So I think there are a lot of, you know, throughout the years, you know, I'm, I'm 29, I'm like, yeah, I would love if, I'm, tr I'm working on it. I feel like this is the decade where like my diet really gets better. You know, I don't know. There's a lot of things I always want to adjust and we're always fluctuating with those healthy habits. But as far as being the best person that I can be, it's important for me and my drummer, Shane Russell and I were actually talking about this last night, is like have people around you who are honest with you and that you're willing to be honest with them back and that you can encourage each other's healthy habits, especially when, you know, we're in touring lifestyles and, um, you know, the types of people who are just, I mean, I'm a go-getter. I'm always so busy. I always have all of these ideas. I don't really have a routine. I'm always trying as a goal to change up how I'm living and so it's it's hard to be just like really balanced and so having people around you that are like being honest with you about maybe ways that you're going overboard or about ways that maybe you're not showing up for each other um, and not showing up for yourself emotionally exercise um, you know uh, substance abuse or or use I think just accountability is a great way to go yeah well I think one thing to remember is that we kind of have to get rid of the comparison because as an artist we are so vulnerably putting ourselves out there um, and one thing we need to remember is that everybody's journey is different so if you're looking at an artist on social media who seems to be living their dream right um, there is a lot of work that goes into that, that we don't see. Um, so for me personally, I think that something that's super important is listening to your body, um, whether that's vocally, physically, mentally. Um, some, again, it's all different for other people, but for me, I need a time of rest, right? Other people are go, 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 Miss Ashley here. Um, go, 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 right? Um, but sometimes you just need that time to kind of, sit in the process and remember that part of the process can be just resting because um, it's super important for the body. Um, yes, and then as far as 
listening to everything else, I think it's figuring out like what's in alignment with you at that moment, because the only thing that is um, that is constant in life is change. And I I really applaud you for constantly trying to change your life because that's the way to roll with the punches. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. is there any uh, is there ever any tension? in the way that you have to engage with image. Um, as an artist, as a person, you like we very often have to promote ourselves and that often means making a little caricature of ourselves that we have to like have, have a part of us inhabit. And you know, it's it, part of it's real, part of it's not, but like I um, have always found that something that you have to negotiate, especially with promotion. Um, has that um, impacted you or have you like, have you wrestled with that at any point? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole image thing, it's like, you know, to, I mean, when you think about it with, uh, with <laughs> sorry, I'm like breaking the mic. The, um, everything, golly gee, the bar is so high for image right now, especially for women and, uh, you know, whatever. Um, in my genre, you know, there's a lot of expectation about things like that. Um, and at the same time, I use it like that, too, because inside, believe it or not, I, I feel like I'm a shy person. But if I put on the image, I can go out and just do all this badass stuff that I couldn't do as my <laughs> normal, everyday character, you know, creating a character and living it. It's lucky because I like skulls and I like Halloween and, you know, all the things that I like, you know, I get to be. And you are putting on a show if you're at the grocery store, you know, wherever. It's it just sort of feeds you, so I've played that. But then there's also a lot of expectations for, you know, how you sound when you sing. You have a very low voice, like a low, like very low register voice. A lot of times people are like, is that you singing? Is that your husband singing? Um, that sounds like a guy, you know, like, and I'm just like, you know, okay, deal with it. And so I've, I, and I write about it, you know, and I, and I get up and scream too, just to watch people's faces, just to like, cause, cause they're uncomfortable. It's the same theory as like a horror movies, like make them a little uncomfortable and then they, they can't, they, it's so compelling, like a train wreck, like they gotta come back. They gotta keep looking at it. Seriously, it's happened, you know. And most of the time if we play with other bands, of course we play the goth night and stuff, but sometimes We'll play with like all these different diverse bands and you know, people are like, mm. uh, sometimes I feel like I get snubbed because I don't have that like ethereal, you know, like ethereal goth, you know. It, it happens, it does. And then there's the age thing, you know, and I'm the, kind of the same way. I'm like, okay, now I'm a, an, an artist of legacy or an artist of age or whatever. But that's okay because this, this you know, I guess just lean into the genre is my only sum up of that. But but yeah, it does it does it does affect it does affect us, me. So know your audience and reevaluate the way that you are engaging with your community. If you feel crushed by not reaching your ideal image or what you think that you should appear as what you how you think you should be being perceived you're probably trying to reach the wrong audience you know and you'll and as hard as you try you'll probably never reach them you know so if you're finding that you think that you're not successful because you don't look a certain way um think about what are ways that I can give back to my community what are ways that I'm not um that I'm not giving, that I'm not interacting with, you know, because you could be you could be totally focused on appearance and on yourself, and maybe you even nail it. Maybe you get the right look, and then you'll kind of find out that you don't really have as many people behind you for longevity. Image. Okay, so image for pipeline is a little bit different um, since there's the three of us and we're a collective. Um, 
So we tend to do kind of themes or colors, that kind of thing. Um, so one day we'll do black and white. Um, and we all kind of have our own style. So the fun part is figuring out what works for us. The hard part is seeing what works with all of us together because um, we want to make sure we look like one unit. Um, but I think that it's a little bit harder for us we have a very specific audience. Um, and with that, you know, we, how would I say this? I guess that there are like some biases right off the bat because we're women, right? And so I, there's this one comment that I remember hearing when we did a competition and it was like, you need more sparkle. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, well, that's hard because we're more than what we look like and we're great people and we're funny and <laughs> talented, right? But in the industry, that's what it calls for. And that can be a little bit challenging to deal with and figure out. I would say it's part of the fun though too. Like <laughs> I love, it. it's fun to, to like feel good and look good and, and play absolutely. that character. And there is no shame in that pursuit either. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I don't want to stop, but we got to stop. Um, I, what's my last question? My last question is, um, if you could speak to someone new in their career or someone, uh, someone of any age, I was going to say someone young, but actually you can start a music career or, or a music path or discipline at any time. Um, if you were to speak to someone new in it, um, which you kind of are actually, um, like, what would you tell them about the why that keeps you going over time or that you want to keep you going for a long time? What would you tell them? Mm -hmm. For me, performance is about connection. Creating music, writing, recording is about connection. And the, the reason why I want to continue working in the industry forever is connection. It's connecting with my audience, it's connecting with other creative people um, in any industry. You know, we're all working together. We're, we all work together. And so my main focus since coming back to Alaska has just been building community and brainstorming ways that I can work with other people because I will repeat myself when one of us is uplifted we are all uplifted I think about us all like holding hands and every once in a while we gotta like catapult one person one person up into the air <laughs> we'll be like you go <laughs> and then the whole state is benefiting from that and then and then eventually everyone you know in the rest of the world is gonna catch on to what we got going on up here in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely connection. That's the number one thing. Um, connection to yourself as well, adding on to that. Um, and really just find that community that you belong in um, because you know that there are going to be, be people rooting for you and it'll only put you to keep going in whatever art form you want to pursue. Uh, this is a really good question. Um, you know, I think that you should think about telling your story. You can pick whatever framework you like. You know, like I said, I like goth things and gothic imagery and stuff like that. I'm just trying to tell my story through that frame. And you can pick any frame, and you can mix the frames up, too. Some of the best things have happened to when it's collaborating either in your mind or literally with other people of two things go together. Um, they actually do go together really well. I've been doing this so long that I get to see, unfortunately, some of the artists that I like pass away and stuff. And, you know, because that's how it's gone down. And some of the family members and friends and things like that. And, um, you know, that's, that's a weird thing to see. But I would say to that person, just keep going and tell your story. What's in, what you do is what's important. We're always telling our story, and people listen because it happens in Alaska. 
They're like, what's, what's goth in Alaska? What, what the heck is that? And that gets us in the door in so many different places and ways because it's like you can't even imagine it. Like, what does it mean? You know, so then you, you start to make up what that is and, and every single moment of your day can be a story for somebody. Like a trip to the grocery store, for me, could be a, something that I put on TikTok or what, not that I'm really great at TikTok yet, but it could be. You know, and it, people would look at it because it's like, well, what are you doing over there in that place? And how do you do that? And how does that go together? And what's that? You make this personal mythology and treat yourself like you're a living myth, like every moment of every day. And people will take up and notice the Internet is a big deal. Use that. Use the Internet to tell your story and to, to you know, spin your mythological yarn. Because my driving force, I, I just don't want to die boring. <laughs> I don't think there's any risk of that, Ivy Silence. <laughs> I want to thank you guys. We're going to continue, and I'm going to say a few more wrap-up words, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Please, everyone, big hand. Yes. Um, check, check. Is it my turn? Is it my turn to get cut off? Check, check. Videos. Okay, thank you. Um, is it time to thank our sponsors and thank our Zoom friends? Yeah, 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 yeah. let's wrap up the thing. Um, hey, um, I, I, thanks. I've been kicking it and spilling drinks on it, and yeah, okay, good. Uh, none of you have ever produced a show before. You don't know what it's like. Um, you know exactly what it's like. Uh, <laughs> um, I have one more thought that I want to leave with you um, as we thank the many people who've made this happen and our sponsors. I've met a number of people, uh, I've known a number of people for a long time and even met some people today who feel like I'm the only one up here doing this, whatever it is. I'm the only one up here doing my thing or I'm the only one up here doing my thing in my community. Um, and, and I understand that feeling and sometimes it's completely flippin' true because we're a small population location. It is easy to be the only one of something here. Um, that in itself is kind of an opportunity, but it can also be incredibly alienating if we're not in each other's court, even when we're doing something very different, right? Like if we're not in the camp of the person who's making music very different from us, um, then a lot of us are gonna wind up feeling alone. Um, and I wound up, um, I can't count how many little random social media interviews or something I've tried to explain about the sea ice going in and out on turning an arm, my favorite thing to watch, and how being a musician, or especially if you're trying to connect with any kind of income from it, is always like hopping from iceberg to iceberg. You know, it's like hopping from flow to flow. It's like uh, it's you you go from MySpace to Facebook to, oh, hey, CD Baby's here now. That's awesome. Okay, hey, Twitter, check it. Oh, Instagram. All right, now I'm getting tired. Um, and now everything, and then there's an algorithm, and then the, oh, God, no one's seeing me anymore. What's a TikTok? I don't know how to do a TikTok. I'm sorry. I don't believe in vertical video, and you cannot make me. I have a Lucille Bluth perspective on this. Um, I'm just going to draw my grumpy old man line right there. Um, and, uh, but we have to jump from thing to thing because none of those things are built for us, right? They're all built to take advantage of us and to make a little bit of money off of us. Okay, the value is reciprocal, but I'm never confused about the fact that those services that we all kind of depend on now exist to extract. They're another extractive industry, right? And we use them, they use us, all right, but that's what keeps us hopping and hopping and hopping and you get tired, right? And we've seen people fall in the water. You know, we've seen people get let down. We've seen people lose it. And so what's the solution to this? Because I don't think it's just hop faster, right? I don't think it's jump higher. And I also don't think it's all get on the same little ice flow because any one solution, we all try 
to jump on board sinks, right? You can see that sometimes with crowdfunding or with other things. The cool new thing comes along and a few big artists make it and then everyone else joins in and it does, doesn't work anymore, right? That's also not the solution. I really think the solution for us, metaphorically speaking, but also, also you can see this be true. I think the solution is to throw out a line, you know? When you, got, when you got a bunch of kayaks loose, right, you throw out a line and you make a flotilla. You extend a line to your neighbor. You don't have to be doing the same thing. You don't have to be going the same place, but it's safer when we're going there together. And I think it's very easy to get alienated up here. It's very easy to feel alone. It's very easy to feel like the only one doing something. I see that as an opportunity. I see our uniqueness, our collective uniqueness and our amazing individual uniqueness. The fact that you can easily be the only one doing your thing here. Like that's kind of amazing if you feel backed up by a community. So I'm really interested in seeing what it looks like when we build the kind of community, the kind of community that conceives of everybody here and their babies, <laughs> and their grandmas, and, and aunties and uncles all over the state, all over the state. How big can we expand our, our sort of family or community conception of Alaska music? Because I think that is one of the ways that we will succeed. So I would invite you as we go forward into a new year, as we try and provide you some resources, not nearly as many as you need, but the ones that we can pull together from the ideas that we have, from what's doable, I would invite you to really try to remember that not you're not alone in this because you are in a web. You are in an ecosystem with a whole bunch of people who even if they're doing something totally different than you, you are in fact all connected and you can make a community out of that because we're in this place. Because this place is the thing we have in common, right? And it's a pretty magical place to have in common. It's so right back to the beginning. Um, I'm gonna stop and thank our sponsors uh, because we made this for free um, for you. <laughs> and that's really important to us. It's also important to the folks who helped us make it that way. That would be um, the Atwood Foundation, the Alaska State Council for the Arts, and the City and Borough of Juneau, um, the uh, municipality of Anchorage also supported the Alaska Music Census and all the projects surrounding it. That is huge. Um, so we owe them our thanks. We also owe some specific thanks to folks who helped us put on today. The Nave, Frostline have given us a tremendous discount and been here like not losing money but like investing. They're investing in this and so we want to invest in them. They've been great neighbors to us. They've been great supporters. Um, and we also have an incredible crew here. I just want to shout out all our tech workers because music tech, live entertainment tech is some of the best work. I love it so much. I mean, I was IATSE Local 918 baby um, and I hope that y'all will remember to always uplift your local tech workers um, and our volunteers. Also, shout out to Lee Post, who created oh, this, yes. I believe, on the fly. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> really cool. That's who, that's... Lee Post gets his own slide, so. No, um... <laughs> can, I, can, I be, can I be a joke and say something? Yeah, say something. No, say something in short. Is that all right? No, go for okay. it. Okay. I'm just going to do it. I'm feeling, sorry. There hasn't been enough music in this music conference. This is very short, but I want you to learn it. Um, now we all push together. We might not agree how far, but we all know which direction gets us closer than we are. And we know we're wasting time with every second we don't start. Every shoulder to the boulder, here we go, heave ho. Every shoulder to the boulder, time to go. One more time, that's it. Now we all push together. We might not agree how far, but we all know which direction gets us closer than we are. And we know we sow destruction with each second we don't start. Every shoulder to the boulder, here we go, heave ho. Every shoulder to the boulder, time to go. Last time, I bet you'll get it. 
Now we all push together. We might not agree how far. We all know which direction. We all know which direction gets us closer than we are. We're no wasting time. No, we're wasting time with every second we don't start. Every shoulder to the boulder. Here we go. Heave ho. Every shoulder to the boulder. Time to go.